Come on in. <laughs> uh, good morning. My name is uh, Randy Zadra, and I'm Director of International Programs uh, here at Carleton. And um, I'll serve as your, um, as your moderator and M MC this morning. Um, I'd like to start this morning's um, session uh, by introducing uh, Dr. Roseanne Runte, who's uh, the president of Carleton University. And I'd like to ask uh, Roseanne to come up and, uh, and welcome our guest, please. Roseanne? Thank you. Uh, tengo mucho gusto en agradecerles en la Universidad Carleton. Um, this year, Canada and Mexico are celebrating 70 years of bilateral relations. And this is just two years before Carleton University was founded. So we're the same vintage, a wonderful time. Carleton is committed to supporting and enhancing the Canada-Mexico relationship. And in 2012, the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs published, as part of its ongoing series, a book called Canada and Mexico, The Unfinished Agenda. And that was our 70th anniversary. So it was a very fortuitous action. But the book, even its title, gives us a challenge for today. So I'm glad to reunite many of the authors I see in the room today um, to take the agenda set in that book forward. It is particularly timely because our three prime ministers and presidents got together for a trilateral summit recently. And our bilateral agenda is still very complex, um, much less with three. Um, we would like to deepen the academic relationship between Carleton University and Mexico and see our student and faculty exchanges multiply, see the research um, grow. It is, I believe, very important that we have enlightened policies, and enlightened policies come through better knowledge and better understanding, and that happens through the work of great scholars like those at Carleton University. And it's obvious that a university president gets to brag. So how can I help but brag about the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs, known around the world for its excellent work? How can I help but brag about our, our um, political science department, former chair is sitting right in front of me and I know she's participating in the program. How can I help but brag about our School of Public Policy, which is about creating good policy, not just for Canada, but for the world. And if we do support education and bring our scholars together, I'm sure that we will build the bridges that will make a better future. I really appreciate the uh, leadership of our ambassador, Suarez. Um, he arrived recently in Canada, and I think one of his first stops was at Carleton University. If not, he diplomatically led me to believe it was. <laughs> and uh, he has been most supportive, and I'm glad to see this event happening here at Carleton University. I hope it's one of many. And it is my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Sergio Alcocer, uh, Mexico's Undersecretary for North America in Mexico's Secretariat of Foreign Relations to us today. Um, it is really extraordinary to have a diplomat who was the um, equivalent of the provost of the university. Um, that means that he understands the importance of academics, um, he, he was coordinator of innovation and development. Those are two big words that are lighting everybody up today. And to be the coordinator before those became big words is really prescient. Um, I think he should be really at home at this university, which is indeed um, Canada's most innovative university. Just ask our students. Um, when our students go out and talk about innovation, they don't just talk, they compete. They put their ideas on the line. So the most entrepreneurial student in Canada, the award, went to a Carleton graduate student this year, a second year chemistry student. And in Canada, there's an ideas contest. And Carleton submitted a number of teams. And they announced the first prize in Toronto. 
Carleton University. Everybody applauded. It was really great. Second prize, Carleton University. Everybody applauded. It was really great. Third prize, the last prize, Carleton University. And all the other universities said, well, there are no more prizes. And we said, oh, gee, <laughs> you've got to learn a little bit of innovation from Carleton University. So we are an innovative institution. And so it's really appropriate to welcome you here today. Um, it is also uh, a great university, the University Autonomica, that, that you have uh, led. And I think that there are many links with Carleton University. Um, secondly, um, our speaker is an engineer. And when I think of engineers, the first thing I think about is building bridges. And what better occupation could a diplomat have than building bridges of understanding? Just move the metaphor a tiny bit. Um, Engineers translate science into practical outcomes, and I would like to see some practical outcomes today that we move from the theory to actual accomplishments and do change the world. Um, engineers are known for being efficient, economical, and innovative, and what a pleasure to start a freezing cold morning with someone who's going to be innovative and economical and efficient. And then engineers have the quality of working in teams. They work together uh, to create good projects. And I think that could be our motto for today and for the next 70 years as we celebrate working together, Canada and Mexico, to create a better North America and a better world. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our speaker. Uh, good morning, everyone, and of course, the first thing I have to do, and this is not only because of good manners, but also because of the, of the nice words that uh, President Ronti mentioned, and thank you very much for this very kind introduction. Indeed, I am an engineer, and uh, engineers are good in terms of giving very short speeches, because uh, we are not very good at writing and, and, and talking, so we're much better at numbers, perhaps. So, well, thank you very much, and I'm thrilled to be in Carleton University. As President Bronte mentioned, I'm an academic on leave from the university, so I'm just for some time at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And, of course, as President Peña pointed out when I was appointed by him, the idea is to, is to indeed, uh, build bridges between Mexico and Canada and Mexico and the United States, which is the, the purview that I have to look after, the North American region. Um, why Mexico and Canada are so important to each other. <clears throat> Not only because now we are on the 70th anniversary of our relation, which is indeed very important. 70 years ago, the relation was marked by the end, almost the end at the time of the Second World War, uh, which we didn't have too many things in common, perhaps uh, being in Bretton Woods together at that time, but not so much. Seventy years later, we have you know, increased our trade dramatically. Just in 20 years past, the, the trade has increased uh, eightfold. Uh, the, the North American free trade agreement have uh, helped to integrate the economies between our countries. So we don't only uh, see each other, we manufacture together. We build things together. And uh, we manufacture cars, which is the most obvious and evident thing that we do. But uh, one thing that we need to, to do now is to uh, innovate together. As Professor Runty mentioned, these are the, the key words for the future, and the key word, I will say, for the future is uh, knowledge, and we need to build this. And I'm very happy to be here, accompanied by three uh, outstanding scholars from Mexico, uh, Professor Silvia Nunez and uh, Teresa Gutierrez Aces, both from the National University of Mexico, and Susana Chacon from the uh, Monterey Tech and who will uh, give you an, an outline on where we are in Mexico, what are the prospects of this very interesting relation that we need to, to, to build uh, much stronger. Um, I'm very happy that, that our ambassador to Canada, uh, Francisco Suarez Davila, uh, was very instrumental in putting together this, this seminar that I, as uh, President Ronti mentioned, uh, is uh, looking forward um, not only sharing experiences and ideas, but also to getting the feedback from you on where we need to move this relation for the years uh, to come. 
Um, I'm very happy that uh, several of our friends from, from Canada are here, uh, Jennifer and Duncan, and uh, I'm sure that, uh, that we were learning from you throughout the, the seminar today. Uh, our countries face uh, interesting challenges in the next uh, few years. As uh, President Bronte mentioned, our leaders will be meeting in a few days. We'll be happy to host uh, Prime Minister Harper <coughs> in Mexico City on the 17th and 18th of uh, February in an official visit. We want to highlight his presence in Mexico uh, because uh, both for Mexico and Canada, for um, Canada for Mexico and uh, Mexico for Canada is the third greatest or larger partner in, in terms of, of trade. And uh, the, we exchange ideas, we exchange people. We don't exchange as many students as we ought to. Uh, Mexico is number eight in terms of the number of international students in Canada, and Canada is number six, but it's long ways to go. We have 4,000 or so Mexican students in Canada and about 400 Canadian students in Mexico. And uh, I think there is a room, an ample room for, for increasing those kind of, of exchanges. But uh, one thing that we'll be discussing on February 17th and 18th and more in the, in the 19th where President Obama joins the two leaders from Mexico and Canada is how can we make North America the most competitive and dynamic region of the world. It's uh, 70 years ago, ago the, the, the competitiveness or the competence of, uh, between countries was the, the key issue that drove the economy and, and politics. Right now, it's not globalization, it's regi regionalization. It's, it's, uh, we, we, we compete in, in terms of, of regions, and certainly North America is one that is uh, responsible for producing about 28, 29 percent of the, of the, wor the world of product. Uh, uh, in, 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 whereas in, in Asia, a similar amount, about 30 percent, is produced by 13 countries. And in Europe, that amount is produced by about 28 countries. So you just have only three countries that take over the, about a third of what the world is producing um, every day. And uh, if we want to, to be as competitive as we have been, of course, we need to, to increase our exchanges and we need to be more innovative. And, and certainly now the new paradigm and energy plays or will play an important role in uh, in a new wave of industry industrialization in the in the region and uh, uh, giving or attracting industries that will really make a comparative difference uh, between our countries. So um, I'll, I'll thank you very much for for having this seminar and uh, I thank to, to Carleton University to to be a great host and I look forward to, to the results of, of this meeting. I, I think that what we need to do in, in the North American region is to, to have a, a structural study and a methodolo methodological assessment of where we are and where we want to be. And in order to have this uh, scholarly um, research and, and, and exposure of the, of the opportunities of North America. And this, is, uh, this can be done, of course, in a university like Carleton. And having a, 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 this uh, prime center for uh, international studies certainly it helps and certainly is, is, is a, a, uh, a key guarantee that a good result can be attained. We're very fortunate to have Ambassador Radetzky, who is the ambassador from uh, Canada to Mexico, who, who is an alumni from Patterson, and uh, she, she brags also of being an alumni from, from, from Patterson. And I'm really sure that uh, having this background can, can be very helpful in understanding much better between our two countries and also understanding the region by, by itself. So again, I will thank you very much and look forward for the, for the results. And uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very kindly, uh, Dr. Akhilsed and uh, Dr. Rante, for uh, setting the framework for today's discussion. Um, we have a, an important morning this morning. We have a number of uh, very distinguished guests, which uh, will take this very, uh, these very ideas forward. And uh, so we look forward to this, and, and thank you all for coming. It's, it's wonderful to see the room full. And I, I believe that's indicative of uh, the interest that exists in taking this relationship further. Uh, so with that, I would uh, like to ask uh, my colleague, Laura McDonald, uh, who many of you know. Uh, Laura has done a tremendous amount of work uh, and really leads our initiatives at Carleton with respect to Canada-Mexico 
relations. She's worked on many, many different things. I don't have time to go through it all. But she is going to moderate the next panel. Uh, so I will, uh, would like to ask, uh, unless you would like to introduce the panel, um, maybe you could do that. And then, and then we can proceed to the first uh, panel session, Laura. Okay, thank you. It's wonderful to see you all here today. Welcome to Dr. Alcocer and um, His Excellency, the Ambassador of Mexico, uh, Ambassador Suarez, and many, many uh, familiar faces in the room um, on this uh, cold, snowy day. So I was thinking uh, globalization is supposed to be about the death of distance, and the fact that we could bring such distinguished um, invitados to Canada and such extremely short notice, I must confess, is really a testament to uh, some of the marvels that globalization has wrought um, in our lives. And I'm really thrilled to welcome you all here today. Of course, we may discover that uh, we haven't entirely conquered distance in uh, trying to forge new relations with, um, with Mexico, um, but there are many uh, important things to discuss. I'd just like to put in a plug for um, the idea of more academic exchanges. I myself have led about three, yes, three North American mil mobility program grants that brought Mexican students to uh, Carleton and sent Carleton students to Mexico over the course of some 15 years, which was fantastic to have that wonderful exchange and to have Mexican students in my classroom was just amazing for the other students. So I hope we can continue to do more of that. So it's my great pleasure to introduce this panel, which is going to um, discuss uh, sort of an overview of the state of the relationship over this past 70 years between Me Mexico and Canada. And we have a very distinguished group indeed. Um, so each panelist will take about 15 minutes uh, maximum. And um, perhaps I should just introduce uh, each of them in turn so that, um, so that people will remember who they are when they're speaking. So first we have a great friend of mine, Maria Teresa Gutierrez Aces, um, and we've been working together, in fact, for quite a few years, so it's fantastic to have Teresina here with us today. Uh, Dr. Gutierrez is a senior researcher in the Economic Research Institute of the Autonomous University at UNAM and a distinguished member of the National System of Researchers in the National Council on Science and Technology, CONACYT. She received the Governor General's International Award in Canadian Studies in 2007 for her outstanding analysis on North American relations, and she's really a pioneer in anal analyzing Canada-Mexico relations. Um, she has participated in many international commissions for the governments of Canada, the US, and Mexico. In 1995, she was invited to participate in the Steering Committee of Bilateral Relations on Mexico-Canada by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Mexico. She's currently a professor in the Faculty of Political and Social Sciences at UNAM and has published many books on the subject. So welcome, Maria Teresa. Thank you. Could I stay you here? Sit down? Yes. Speak, or do you want to stand up? Maybe people see you better. Oh, they don't need. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Good morning. Uh, first of all, I would like to, to thank the Mexican Embassy in Mexico and Carlton University for this uh, wonderful invitation. Um, thank you. I was here when we celebrated the 70th anniversary of Mexico-Canada relation, and ten, ten years later, I am here again, and that is absolutely great. Je voudrais aussi eh, remercier eh, l'ambassade eh, du, du Mexique eh, au Canada et l'Université du Carlton. Je voudrais aussi eh, 
remercier le professeur eh, qui travaille ici à l'Université de Carlton, les universités francophones. Eh, je suis bien content d'être ici. Eh, bon, but, eh, I'm going to present my, my paper. Eh, when Ambassador eh, Suarez asked me eh, to be here, he asked me to make something like a, an overview of a, the historical relation. I will try to do my best. Uh, it's impossible to talk in 50 minutes about 70 years of relation, but uh, um, I would like at least uh, to present some important highlights in the, in the relation. Towards the end of 1990, when Mexico and Canada decide to negotiate a trilateral free trade agreement with the United States, they suddenly had to confront an undeniable fact. During the past 50 years, uh, neither one had advanced in their knowledge of the other. Throughout the negotiation process, those who were in one way or another connected to NAFTA tried to gain expertise in the shortest time possible regarding the most relevant issues of Canadian economy and policy in order to define a, a strategy for the Mexican negotiating team, which in most cases I would call defensive rather than complementary. Although much data was collected and many documents were drafted, the information that was gathered on Canada and Canada was mostly related to issues considered important in relation to the negotiation itself and did not focus uh, on those aspects that, that, could, that would lead to a greater knowledge of an understanding between the two societies. Now do with standing alongside the negotiation, another process developed, one which in my opinion was no less important. Towards the end of 1990, a growing number of persons and organizations in Canada began to study Mexico from their own professional and political perspective, also Canada. This phenomenon a spontaneous encounter of two societies was and is a process in which, in most cases, was free from control or regulation required by official agencies, Mexican or Canadians. Thus, there were two parallel movements towards the, the mutual discovery. One began and grew as a need of groups directly involved, basically civil servants at all levels of government from those secretariats which, secretariats which consider themselves more involved by the negotiation, commerce and industrial development, foreign affairs, agriculture, labor, mine, and natural resources, among others. At this level, in my opinion, the Mexican negotiating team hesitated and decided to concentrate its energy on its strategy regarding the United States. Not much time was spent on creating a Canada file, which could later serve as the basis for future negotiations since the main worry was the agreement with the United States. This attitude clearly reflects what was and will continue to be the Achille Hill of Mexico-Canada relation, the overwhelming presence of the United States in its neighbors' political and economic affairs. During the Canada-US free trade negotiation in 1987, Canada committed a great deal of its human and monetary resources to the bilateral agreement. When the time came for the trilateral negotiations, it felt that it was necessary to repeat that effort. As regards Mexico, the Canadian focus on protecting acquired interests and trying to obtain new advantage from the trilateral relation. At a later moment, the official Mexican group, which included representatives from the government and business community, felt that it should rectify its strategy and pay more attention in Canada, to Canada. This change came about when groups opposing NAFTA and trade unions began a debate which addressed the need to answer at least two important questions. Why? Was the first free trade agreement unpopular in Canada? What lessons made Mexico learn from the Canadian experience 
and thus avoid making the same mistakes during the negotiations. Towards the end of 1990, two important conferences in Mexico became the watershed between the old and the new attitude towards Canada. The first was organized by the National Action Party, traditionally a middle class party, political right wing, and historically the pre main opposition, whose members, for the first most part, come from the private sector and has an enormous influence in industry and commerce. The main purpose of that gathering was to take advantage about the Canadian experience in this matter before to officially take a stand about the negotiation of NAFTA. 18 renewed Canadians were invited to discuss the impacts of CUFTA in the Canadian economy. The diversity of the speakers reflect the diversity of contemporary Canadian society. Various political opinion, opinions and parties were represented, government and private sector representatives, as well as dissident attended, representatives from the different provinces, academics, etc. Since it was an event organized by a center-right political party, the public was much larger than that which would have attended a conference sponsored by a left-wing organization. The conference brought in its wake important consequences. Entrepreneurial groups learned much from their Canadian interlocutors, the COESE, Entrepreneurial Export Council, which represented the Mexican private sector during the negotiation, was directly influenced by the Canadian Business Council on national issues experience. The Mexican negotiating team prepared a good deal on its strategy starting from the Canadian experience and agencies such as Pemex, Petróleos Mexicanos, listened attentively to the discussion on CUFTA negotiation related to the energy sector and the proportionality clause, which required, required Canada to maintain its current share of energy exports to the United States, even in Canadian experience short days. During the second conference, which was held only a few days after the first, more than 40 Canadians, again, from various social organizations and trade union, spoke out against the bilateral free trade agreement. Their statement came as a surprise to the Mexican public, who of the Sudan, who of Sudan became aware of important aspects of the Canadian situation and some of its problems. This conference, too, led to important consequences. It spawned the Mexican Action Network, which encouraged critical debate regarding Mexico's role in NAFTA negotiation. It also had an impact on the Mexican labor movement because it uncovered the huge disparities that already existed between the two countries as regards salaries, social security, labor rights, and union practice. Another important result was the current of opinion that in turn led to the creation of the NAFTA side agreements on labor and environmental issues. However, during the 1992 and at the beginning of 1993, the pressure exerted by the U.S. government and certain civil organizations who were concerned about election and human rights in Mexico forced Mexicans into seeking a closer relation with Canadian political organization. The creation of Mexico Federal Electoral Institute received significant support from Election Canada. Likewise, the Institute became interested in Canada 1992 constitutional referendum and 1993 Canada federal election. And Mexican legislator attended regularly the Conservative Party Convention and also the Quebec Party and the Liberal Party Conventions. The relationship of this institution narrowed over the years and the large number of IFE officials were training in Canada. Thanks to the advice of Election Canada, observers of the election were trained. In this sense, the, dem the democratization of Mexico has a great debt to Canada. All of these uh, leads to conclude that over and above the trilateral agreement, it is a fact that civil society in both Mexico and Canada has cleared away the smoke screen 
that separated the two countries. In this way, the human flow between these nations will not easily be stopped, nor will it be dependent on commercial exchange or investment ventures. The parallel agreements, the side agreements, together with the NAFTA, have given rise to a new relationship which will compel both Mexicans and Canadians to exchange knowledge and opinions, and above all, as citizens of the North American region to coordinate their policies. Although the most immense part of the negotiation has be, been the debate concerning U.S. interests, we cannot deny that the Canadian presence and initiative regarding Mexico has been greater than that of the United States. I would now like to discuss briefly and discuss what had been the nature of this relationship between 1994. This relation does not begin in 1990, nor in 97, when Trudeau's foreign policy looked to Latin America as an answer to the third option. The relation that's back to the end of the 19th century. In 1865, before Canada was a confederation, representatives from British colonies, Canada, Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, and Prince Edward Island, met in Quebec to discuss the possibilities the Mexican market offered as a commercial alternative to the U.S. market. This point to the fact that both Mexico and Canada have lived through similar, though not always, concurrent process. The relationship to the United States share a common past which yields an instructive lesson since their beginning as independent nations, both were interested in establish alternate markets to reduce the excessive weight of the U.S. economy. What were the Canadians who traveled to Mexico in the 19th century like? We can speak of a significant Canadian presence at the beginning of 20th century, when a group of venturesome entrepreneurs invested in the modernization of Mexico infrastructure. These business pioneers who came to the fore during a period of great economic prosperity in Canada in 19 considered Latin America the, the ideal place to increase their capital and make fantastic deals. Everything seems to come together. In Mexico, Porfirio Diaz regime was characterized by his energetic rule. Foreign investment was considered necessary to the modernize the country and a certain amount of ill will towards the United States favored the presence of other countries in Mexico. Canada, with its ties to the British Empire and its moderately, moderately independent stance vis-a-vis -vis the United States, was an attractive alternative. Porfirio Diaz knew that without railroads, modern transport, efficient ports, telegraphs, and electricity, the modernization process would be impossible. Those who had built the Canadian Pacific Railroad were looking for new markets. This convergence of interests couldn't have been more favorable. The Canadians were convinced that the profits they could make in Mexico would be greater than any they could make if they remained in their own country. Those Canadians were not so much different from their 21 century counterparts. They told that Canada economy set limits which would sooner or later affect their gains. Furthermore, the business pioneer of the early 90s were confident that the market niche that they were going to establish outside Canada could not be contested. There especially was technology applied to utilities in the service sector and to transportation and communication. Canadians in Mexico were the first to apply management principles convenient with the state-of-the-art technology and an efficient administration of earnings that originally came from Canada. They profit from the commercial routes the British has opened in Latin America, conscious of their advantage over Mexican, Brazilian, or Argentinian entrepreneurs. They decide to exploit the benefits offered then by the international conjuncture, a British empire that was retreating from Latin America, an economic sector that was not controlled by the United States, and an urgent need to modernize 
the infrastructure of many Mexican cities that were anxious to be linked with other cities, both, excuse me, in Mexico and abroad. Thus, turn of the century, Canadians constantly repeated that market imperfections only made local economies more interesting. Thus, Canadian Invest in Mexico focused on the transfer of mature technology to marginal re regions, where the foreign investors and engineers who built the country's first hydroelectric plants were acclaimed as gods. Technology, exp technological expertise, managerial skills, and the repatriation of capital from Canada to Mexico came together in the building of an empire of urban services that gra gradually connected Mexico economic arteries. In 1902, Fred Stark Pearson went to Mexico and visited the waterfall, the waterfall formed by the Necaxa River. He outlined a project to the Mexican government and his financial backers in Canada, the construction of a hydroelectric plant shortly after with capital from Montreal, he founds the Mexican Light Power Company, which competes with the German-owned Mexican Electric Works until the later is bought in cash by the Canadians. Pearson then signs a contract whereby his firm will, will supply electricity to Mexico until the year 2012. Pearson Company, service not only cities street, but on industry, mines, trains, and trolley cars. In 1906, Pearson was president of the Mexico City Street Car Company. Canadians held 75% of the shares. The existence of the light and power company was obviously some problems for the Mexican government when negotiated exceptions on energy in NAFTA. In 1911, Canada and Great Britain accounted for 89% of foreign investment in telegraphs, telephone, water, electricity, and hydroelectric plants, while the United States controlled only 6%. The same year, 38% of total foreign investment in Mexico corresponded to the United States, and 30% to Canada and Great Britain. Foreign banks, arrived in Mexico together with the above-mentioned investment. Among them, the Bank of Montreal and the Canadian Commerce Bank, both of which were established to guarantee, to guarantee and regulate the use of Canadian capital for the business pioneers. The first trade commissioner from the Canadian government was sent to Mexico in 1905. Donnelly, the designation introduced a new stage in Canadian foreign policy. The newfound economic space in Latin America was of interest not only to a few Canadian businessmen, now it was a matter of concern for the government as well. Here, we can close the first stage in Mexico-Canada relation, but not without mention the following points which will help to us understand subsequent stage. Initially, there were two different types of actors in Mexico-Canada relation. The first is made up by investors and entrepreneurs who decide to venture into Mexico on their own. The second type consists of those few government representatives that since 1905 have been sent to Mexico. Both are a reflection of the Canadian society at the beginning of the 20th century, when private economic groups were not as identified with the government strategy as was later the case. Canada's official presence in Mexico reflects not only the development of the Canadian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, created only in 1909, but the debate on foreign policy, diplomatic relations, and international trade policies in Canada. In 1920, Canada's trade commissioner in Mexico was severely reprimanded because he had interviewed several Me Mexican government representatives regarding investment opportunities in Mexico. This attitude changed radically after 1946 when Mexico and Canada signed a reciprocal trade agreement, the first one. Canadian entrepreneurs, past and present, 
are interested in an investment strategy focused on transportation, telecommunication services related to natural resources such as water, oil, and mines. Possible. The great difference between the first Canadians in Mexico and those that began to arrive during the 1940 was that the later lived according to the parameters set by the Cold War. For Mexico and Canada, this situation was especially important because their proximity to the U.S. overrode any political or commercial decision that may try to, the mutually, to mutually establish. A few examples illustrate the, cl the climate that prevailed between 1940s and the 1990s. Canada first established diplomatic relations in Latin America with Argentina, Brazil, and Chile. Surprisingly, not with Mexico, with whom it had commercial ties since the early 90s. The answer to this must be found in the U.S. hemispherical policy. The United States felt that Canada should support them to prevent <coughs> South America from forming alliances with totalitarian governments. The United States always compelled Mexico and Canada to support its political and commercial positions. As regard the former, Canada has long been pressured into sharing U.S. geopolitical projects. Respecting the later, U.S. free trade and entrepreneurial position were an important influence on Canada, who was co-founder with the United States of the GATT, the IMF, excuse me, IMF, and the NATO. Mexico did not accept free trade as part of its economic policy until 1986 and lived until then through a period filled with conflicts, while Canada adopt, adapted this policy since the end of the 1940s. Both Mexico and Canada built their industrialization with protectionist tariff policies. Mexico maintained those policies from 1944 to 1982, Canada until 1979. Possibly, one of the greatest differences between the two countries lies in the decision regarding foreign investment and state control of natural resources. Until close to 1970, Canada officially considered that foreign investment was a great asset for economic development, while Mexico held a stricter position and put obstacles in the way of its entry to the country. Mexico began to nationalize its natural resources in 1938 when it expropriated foreign oil companies. Canada didn't start the process until the 1970s. This are some of the elements that condition the relation between Mexico and Canada. Now with the Sandy, in 1946, a Canadian trade mission to Latin America led to the signing of a trade agreement with Mexico. A code of conduct was established based on the principles of the most favored nation, a position based on its status as the developing countries that Mexico also wielded in its commercial relation with the United States. Starting with this agreement, the relationship began to flow through diplomatic channels the arrival of businessman or trade mission was handled by the Canadian Embassy, which opened its door in 1944. In 1953, the possibility of creating a Mexico-Canada Chamber of Commerce was discussed. By then, economic conditions in Mexico were stable and the country was interested in doing business with Canada. But it was not until 1969 the that entrepreneurs found the Canadian Association for Latin America. In 1959, Adolfo López Mateos became the first Mexican president to make an official visit to Ottawa. A few months later, Prime Minister John Deffenbaker returned to the visit. This was the first time that the proximity between the two countries was mentioned. It was also Mexico's first attempt to appear on the international scene, specifically in North America. These two heads of state ended a stage of discreet diplomacy and began a period of moderate international activism, which included looking for economic space that would be supplementary and alternate to those 
offered by the United States. These two visits were the immediate precedent of the third option policy, maintained by both countries under Prime Minister Trudeau and President Echeverria. The high point in Mexico-Canada relation before 1990, NAFTA, came in 1968 with the arrival of the Canadian ministerial mission. Their report led to the famous white book, Foreign Policy for Canadians, which contains Mitchell Sharp wrote outline of Canadian foreign policy. The Canadian International Development Agency, CIDA, and the Society for Export Expansion were founded that same year, the former to coordinate Canadian participation in developing countries, and the later to finance Canadian export. Shortly after, still 1968, a joint ministerial committee was established in Mexico to study issues of common interest to the economy and politics, politics of both countries. The year between 1980 and 1995 were a rise in cooperation committees in various economic sectors, energy, agriculture, environment, finance, tourism, etc. In 1980, more than a decade later, the two countries create a committee for cooperation on energy because of the particular relevance of the energy sector to each country and to the balance of trade between them. In effect, during that period and until now, the balance of trade favored Mexico. Mexico increased its exports of manufactured goods to Canada counting Canada as one of its 10 trading partners. Finally, since 1985 to 1994, the Canadian Export Development Corporation financed more than 10 lines of credit in Mexico. Moreover, the Canadian International Development Corporation, CIDA, supported until the time when Mexico access to the, to the OCD, more than 25 projects involving investment development and Canadian technology transfer to Mexico. To date, the Canada Fund, Fondo Canada, also continue to support, marginal, uh, to support marginalized communities, although less funding since Mexico ceased to be a subject of development aid when became full member of the, the, EC, the OCD. This avalanche of, of agreements, resolution, memorandums, and presidential visit leads us to believe that the official intention was to place the bilateral relation within a framework, framework that was closer to the new international economic reality. Today, Canada economic presence in Mexico is apparent as, at various levels, as indicate part of Canadian state strategy, as part of the specific interests of certain provinces, some like Quebec, Ontario, and Alberta, have a great presence in Mexico than others. As private individuals, the number of a small and medium-sized business involved in joint ventures in remote parts of Mexico is astounding. As part of transnational firms with main offices in the United States that have been relocated from Canada to Mexico. To Mexico. Mexico today offers Canada a promising opportunity for investment. If it were to cater to Mexico's new needs, Canada could reproduce the old business pioneer strategy and take advantage of a demand for services related to the environment, petrochemical, telephone, and computer industries, geology, topography, and bi biotech. Finally, I believe that today, the real challenge Canada faces in Mexico is that of building a more dynamic trade strategy, less spontaneous than those built in the past, based on the supposition that the reshaping of tax or production on the international level will give it an opportunity in the Mexican service sector. The very dynamics of the commercial opening in Mexico is forming a new economic structure whose needs today cannot be fully most met by Mexican alone. There is an enormous technological gap, part of which Canada can surely fill. It would be utopian to think that Mexico can confront the impact produced by NAFTA on its own without any kind of support from abroad. 
There are great vacuums in Mexico in the areas of technological knowledge and professional training, which put it at, the, at a disadvantage as it faces the great change imposed by the globalization process in this context. Canada can play an important role as innovative partner. Thank you. Um, thank you, Teresina. I'll just stay here for the next part. So uh, our next speaker is Duncan Wood, who's also a longtime student of Canada-Mexico relations. Duncan is the director of the Mexico Institute at the Woodrow Wilson Center, International Center for Scholars. Um, Dr. Wood was a professor and the director of the International Relations Program in the Instituto Tecnológico Autónomo de México, ITAM, in Mexico City. He's also worked as a researcher in the um, cent Center for Economic International Rights, uh, Law, sorry, in, at ITAM. And he's a member of the uh, National uh, Research System of Mexico, a member of the Editorial Board of Foreign Affairs Latino America, and has been an editorial advisor to Reforma newspaper. Uh, he's also worked as a technical secretary of the Red Mexicana de Energia, a group of experts in the er in area of energy policy in Mexico. And his uh, current research, uh, in addition to the great work he's doing coordinating the Mexico Institute, focuses on Mexican energy policy, including renewable energy and North American relations. He studied in the UK and Canada and received his PhD in political studies from Queen's University in 1996. Welcome, Duncan. problem for me. Um, I uh, thank you for having me here today. I'd like to thank the, uh, uh, the embassy for organizing all of this and of course Carlton University um, for hosting. Um, I always begin these sessions by saying that I think I'm the perfect NAFTA citizen. I, uh, I got my PhD in Canada. Um, I married a Canadian. I moved to Mexico. I had two children in Mexico. I worked there for 17 years. I got divorced. My ex-wife moved back to Canada. My Mexican children now live in Canada. I'm here every three weeks. I just married an American. I work in the United States now. I travel to Mexico every three weeks. I travel to Canada every three weeks. And I'm a citizen of none of the three countries. <laughs> Which makes me a peculiarly impartial observer, I think. Um, and for 17 years when I lived in Mexico, um, it was one of those uh, wonderful twists of fate that I arrived in, uh, uh, in Mexico and my boss at the university uh, said to me, he said, Duncan, we've just hired you from Canada. Uh, you can be our head of Canadian studies. And I said, okay, I took a PhD in Canada, but I never took a course on Canadian politics or society. I know very little about Canada apart from how to marry one. Um, and... He said, it doesn't matter, you know more than everybody else in the kingdom of the blind, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> and so I, I dedicated myself to studying the bilateral relationship between, uh, between Mexico and Canada. And I have to say that it's an extraordinarily interesting and complex story, but it's also a hugely dysfunctional relationship. And that's really where I'd like to begin, is that throughout the time that I studied that relationship, there were ups and downs, there were fits and starts, there was a jump ahead, it seemed, and then reality set in. And every time that we got enthusiastic that something was actually happening in the bilateral relationship, very quickly that enthusiasm died away. Because the essential question, I think, that there's always been with Canada-Mexico relations is, where's the beef? Now, wh what's really there? Is there a there there, I guess? And there is a there there. As, as, as uh, Maria Teresa just described, the economic relationship has gone from strength to strength particularly over the last 20 years. The impressive growth in trade and investment is one thing, but in terms of the actual relationship and understanding between the two countries, and I have colleagues here today who will be able to talk about this with much greater depth of, uh, of knowledge than I do, but the fact is, is that Canadians really don't get Mexico. Canadians don't understand what Mexico is, and I think that Mexicans don't really understand Canada either. I think partly it's because of the distance, and I don't just mean that in a, in a, in a geographical sense. I think it's partly because of the, the cultural distance between the two. It's easy for the United States and Mexico to develop a closer understanding just simply because of the demographics. 
There's a border there, yes, but throughout the United States, I mean, in parts of the northeast of the United States, you see enormous migrant populations there. It's becoming a lot more familiar, and that familiarity sometimes breeds contempt, absolutely, but that's a process that we're going through to gradually get to that understanding. We haven't seen that in Canada. I remember a meeting about eight years ago um, up here in Ottawa with folks from, uh, uh, from uh, uh, DFATE, who were saying, maybe we need to just import a lot more Mexicans into Canada in order to understand. I said, isn't that putting the cart before the horse in some sense? But this was a genuine proposal from somebody who was working there saying, we clearly need more Mexicans in Canada. And I actually think there's something in that. And we'll see that change over time, but it's not going to happen anytime soon. I want to say a few words about the NAFTA because I was asked by uh, Fernando um, Gonzalez Seife, who, uh, thank you for the invitation, uh, for me to come here today um, to talk a little bit about the NAFTA, and of course, you know, in the in the mark of the uh, in the framework of the 20th anniversary of the NAFTA, we have to say that NAFTA has been an unqualified success if we measure it by its original intent. The goal was to increase trade and investment between the three countries, and that's exactly what it's done. There were very limited goals there. Remember, this was a 20th century free trade agreement. The idea was just simply to increase economic ties. It wasn't to create any kind of superstructure. It wasn't to create supranational institutions. Yes, there were the side agreements, and yes, we have real potential at this point in time for a North American Development Bank to really work on a number of infrastructure and environmental issues along the US-Mexico border. But we need a lot more than that, I think, to face the 21st century. We're moving from NAFTA, of course, into the TPP, and I'm delighted that both Mexico and Canada are in the negotiations for the TPP. As controversial as that is going to be, that is the next big battle that's going to take place in Washington, is can we get a Trans-Pacific Partnership approved there? And how will the three North American countries work together? One of the crucial questions in the TPP that very few people talk about is, are we going to identify uh, rules of origin on a regional basis as opposed to on a country-specific basis. The three economies in North America are so integrated, as uh, Sergio Alcocer said early, earlier on, we don't just trade things, we build things together. How do you actually separate a Canadian car from an American car from a Mexican car? An American plane from a Mexican plane from a Canadian plane? When you have these integrated production processes across the region, we need to think about how North America goes out there into the world. And those are discussions which are taking place right now between the United States and Mexico. But I don't see Canada there at the, at the table on a regular basis. I assume this is going to be one of the issues that is discussed in the North American Leaders Summit. But the key question here is we live now in a globally competitive world. We are a region, and we're an open region, and we need to be an open region. But is that enough? Well, one of the things about the Canada-Mexico relationship, I think, is that we've never really got to get beyond, we've, not, we've never managed to get beyond the trade and investment agenda. We've talked about lots of interesting things. We have the Seasoned Agricultural Workers Program. We had the Canada-Mexico Partnership, which I got very excited about for a small while before I saw that it wasn't really anything really happening there. We had the Canada-Mexico Joint Action Plan, some nice words. And we had the visa problems. The end of Canadian studies funding, if there was a short-sighted or more short-sighted decision in Canadian public policy history, I, I don't know of it, that you cut a few million dollars from the budget and essentially cut off understanding of Canada around the world. It decimated the Canadian studies community in Mexico. I remember that people just basically said, well, if there's no money, I'm not going to study it. And if you actually did the economics of Canadian studies funding in Mexico, it more than paid for itself, just simply by people coming back to Canada and spending their dollars in Canada on research trips, et cetera. So what have we seen now? We've seen that the Canadian government has basically said, we're not particularly interested in Mexico. And we don't, we're not particularly interested in Mexicans understanding who we are either. Part of this, I believe, stems from what is essentially Canada's zero-sum approach in Washington, D.C. I've said it many times over the years, but I think that the Canadian government, and this is not just a conservative or a liberal government, but Canadian governments in general, have a very, very insecure approach in their bilateral relationship with the United States. Whenever anybody is mentioned ahead of Canada as being America's best friend, you remember after 9-11 when Tony Blair was you know, George Bush's best friend, 
People here in Canada rent their clothes. They pull their hair and say, what about us? Didn't we take in all of those American tra travelers on 9-11 when the planes were grounded and we took them into our homes? Aren't we sort of you know, brothers and sisters in, in North America? And whenever Mexico is mentioned ahead of Canada in Washington, there's an enormous amount of anxiety at the Canadian Embassy on Pennsylvania Avenue. And the fact is, is that over the past few years, Mexico has done a much better job of having its message heard in Washington. And the Canadian response to that has been to say, well, we're important too. Travel to Washington right now and you will see a public relations campaign all over the city about the Keystone Pipeline, absolutely. But it's about Canada is, is the United States' biggest energy partner. Canada matters more than any other country. For those of you who have been to the Canadian Embassy in Washington, you'll see when you walk in that big map that's on the wall, which has all of the trade and investment ties going back across the, the border, how many jobs in American states depend upon trade and investment with Canada, et cetera, et cetera. And that, that one of the nicest features of that map, I think, is that along the border, it says, we've got your back. As if to say, we're protecting the back door here. You can trust our border. And it calls to mind immediately in the context of these conversations about after 9-11, when the Canadian government refused to talk borders on a trilateral basis because they didn't want to see the Mexicanization of the Canadian border. That was the term that was actually used. And I thought that brought to, uh, to the forefront many of the concerns and the real dysfunctionality of the relationship in North America from a Canadian point of view. And what I'd like to say here is that it seems to me that we're lacking a long-term vision. The long-term vision simply isn't there. Mexico is going to grow much, much faster than either the United States or Canada in the future. The potential for growth in North America is there, south of the Rio Bravo. The potential for growth is there. The potential for real development is there. Mexico will surpass Canada in size at some point over the next 20, 25 years. That's going to be a big moment for Canada in terms of the readjustment. Canada will then be by far the junior partner in the North American trilateral relationship, if it isn't already. And the reason why I say that is because look at what has happened over the last 13 months. Everybody in this room is aware of what's taken place in Mexico, the extraordinary reform agenda that's been put in place by President Enrique Peña Nieto. And the Mexican Congress, let's give them their credit as well, that they've managed to get the job done. And I was just reading some, uh, some uh, journalistic notes this morning. Uh, that the Mexican Congress has just committed itself to working extra sessions during this spring session of Congress in order to get the impressive list of secondary legislation passed so that the reforms that were passed last year actually mean something this year. Uh, the United States has recognized this, and you look at the way that the bilateral relationship between the United States and Mexico has changed. We have a high-level economic dialogue that's underway between Mexico and the United States that actually has substance. We have a CEO dialogue between Mexico and the United States, which is in parallel with that. Unfortunately, the two things aren't linked in quite the way they should be, but I think we're, we're working towards that. We have the signing of the FOBESI, a bilateral fund for higher education, innovation, and research. And I know that there's a lot of wrinkles that need to be ironed out in that, and, and Sergio works you know, 24 hours a day or 25 hours a day probably trying to get this to, to, to work out. And part of the problem there is you're dealing with a federal education structure on the Mexican side and a state-level education structure on the U.S. side. But everybody recognizes that this is the kind of initiative that needs to take place because, let's face it, as Sergio said in his introductory notes, the future of competitiveness is not necessarily about natural resources. It's not about manufacturing. It's not even really about money. It's about human talent. It's about human capital. It's about innovation. And it's going to be about mobility as well. One of the good things about the Canada-Mexico relationship is that a few years ago, an agreement was signed on youth mobility between the two countries. And that's something that I think we have to grab onto and make sure that we develop in the future. But if you look at all three countries in North America today, and you look at where their human resources stand, there was a very interesting survey that was uh, published by a firm called Hayes Recruiting uh, recently, which identified a thermometer for each of the countries of the OECD, essentially, to see how well, uh, sorry, how much demand there is in their economies for uh, human capital and how their education systems are supplying that. And in all three North American countries, there are challenges. 
But Mexico is by far the best place to satisfy the demand that exists in North America. Look at the PISA rankings, the OECD's education rankings. All three North American countries face very serious challenges at the moment. Mexico, probably the biggest of all, just simply because in comparison with the, the other OECD, OECD nations, it does very, very badly. But if you look at what's happening in Mexico, in fact, Mexico is advancing more rapidly than almost any other OECD nation in terms of improving its education system. Human capital matters. And as, uh, as Laura said, my area is really about energy. And the, the project that we've undertaken at the Wilson Center's Mexico Institute this year is to actually look at the demands for human capital in the energy sector in Mexico. Everybody's talking about North America be being the new Middle East in terms of energy resources. There's this new abundance of energy that's there. Yes, it's the, the oil sands in Canada. It's the shale and tight oil resources in the United States. It's Mexico's energy reform and the enormous resources that still await under the Gulf of Mexico and, of course, in Mexico's own shale uh, reserves. And there seems to be no limit to this, but there is a limit. And the limit is human talent. Everybody knows that you need human beings to actually make this work. You don't just need the dirty oil engineers who go out there, but to mention that, do you know that Mexico produces more engineers every year than the United States? That's something which we need to think about very, very seriously. It's not that you need engineers to go out there and get the oil out of the ground. You need people who are experts in, in, in seismic mapping. You need people who are experts in information technology. You need people who are experts in management of the oil industry. And Mexico has the potential to do that because of the demographics of the country. Think about how many young people are coming through the education system right there. In order to do that well, we need to adopt a regional approach. There are huge opportunities, not just in energy, but across the board for improving competitiveness and prosperity in North America. As I said, the future is going to be determined by knowledge and education, human capital. All three of the NAFTA countries face this challenge. And it requires a cooperative response. And so I think it's timely that we have a call for a North American Education and Innovation Fund. What's happening between Mexico and the United States with the FOBESI, the Bilateral Fund for edu Higher Education, Innovation, and Research, is something which should be happening on a trilateral basis. Canada should get on board. This is something that would benefit Canada in the long term much more than it would benefit Mexico. This is something where Canada needs to change the chip in its head and to say, OK, Mexico is really the future, so let's got to get on board with that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Duncan. And our final speaker on this session is uh, Susana Chacon. Oh, yes, I did notice there are chairs here. If you guys want to feel free to come sit, up, uh, sit down at an actual chair. Um, uh, sorry, Susana Chacon is currently Editor-in-Chief of Foreign Policy Mexican edit Edition. She's also Professor at the Graduate School of Public Administration and Public Policy and at EGADE Business School at the Tecnológico de Monterrey University in Mexico City. She is also Secretary General of the Club of Rome and Editorialist of the Mexican newspaper El Universal and a member of the World Academy of Arts and Sciences. She is the author and coordinator of eight books. She has uh, numerous book chapters and articles in different journals and uh, is an active participant in international discussions related to the issues we're talking about today. Welcome, Susana. Thank you so much, Lara. I have a different problem with the microphone than Duncan. Thank you so much. I think it's much better later. Well, uh, first of all, I, I also would like to, 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 co to congratulate the, the Mexican embassy here, the, the foreign minister of uh, foreign, uh, uh, under secretary uh, Sergio Alcocer, and of course to thank you very much the, uh, uh, the Carlton University for, for hosting this event today. Uh, I'm very, very happy and I feel really very honored to, to be here with you today. And uh, I'm, I'm gonna try to, to make my presentation divided in, in two different parts. One, the first one will be focused in some highlights on, on the current history. I'm going back a little bit to history, but just the 20th century. And then uh, I'll, I'll focus on, on eight ideas that I think that uh, there are some of the issues where we can start building up in the, in the considering this, this point of how to build 
a long-term relation, bilateral relation, uh, US, uh, uh, aside from the US-Canadian relation. So in, in the general overview, I would say that uh, Mexico was one of the first countries with which Canada established diplomatic relations 70 years ago. Uh, just as Canada was coming of uh, age as, as a sovereign country with, with uh, an, an autonomous uh, foreign policy, Canada and Mexico uh, relation extended even further than 1944. Uh, and, and we know very well that we were allies during the Second World War and people-to-people uh, -people exchanges had existed ever since the, the, the beginning of both countries. Since 1944, uh, the relation has taken off in, in a new dimension, uh, reflecting on our shared heritage and, and also common uh, objectives. 1956, uh, it was at, uh, the first summit of the leaders of North America took place. This was with Dwight Eisenhower, Ruiz Cortines, and Luis San Loran. 1960, uh, uh, John Diffenbanker makes his first visit as uh, the Canadian head of state to Mexico. And, and then we had a, a very strong relation from the 60s to the 90s. And there we can see that, uh, as Teresina mentioned, and I, w I would like to, to uh, reconsider that idea, that President Echeverria, where we had a switch of from, from a Pacific or, or uh, uh, not very dynamic foreign policy to a very dynamic one. Um, he, he made a first visit to Canada in 1970, and then uh, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau uh, went back to Mexico in 76 and then in uh, 1982. Mexico and Canada signed, the, uh, of course, the, the, the Agricultural Worker uh, Treaty four years ago in 74, but also in 76, there was a very important cultural agreement uh, with, with a lot of fellowships that I think that we have to reconsider again, as Duncan was mentioning, just in the case of the US-Mexican relation, in terms of fellowships for, for Mexicans and Canadians to, to go back. Uh, we, since 1975, we have the, the interparliamentary meetings that's been in place uh, basically almost four years as well. And uh, by early 90s, 25 Canadians, departments, and agencies were participating participate in, in, in regular uh, official uh, meetings with Mexicans. Over 80 bilateral agreements had been signed covering different areas, agriculture, transportation, justice, consular affairs, communication, education, health, tourism, human rights, labor, and environment. We know very well that since NAFTA in 1994, uh, 20 years ago, uh, this marked a, a pivotal uh, moment in the Canada-Mexican relation, and, and it helped propel trade and investment between both countries uh, with unprecedented levels. But it, it's still a lot to go, and, and we have to do many things even if it will now from, uh, have a, a very complex and, and deep relation since, since 1994. Canadian and Mexican economic relations are, are reaching new heights, evolving from, from beyond a mainly export-oriented trade relationship to integrated to, to the 21st North American production platform. There's something very important, which is the people-to-people -people exchanges uh, that are also flourishing with almost uh, two million uh, Canadians visiting Mexico annually, and there is also a very important number of Mexicans coming to Canada. Uh, but they're, they're visiting Mexico, and, and also they are staying there, as you know very well, uh, for at least this season, which is not the best season uh, uh, for, for, for Canadians. They are going either to San Miguel Allende or to uh, Ajijic in Jalisco. So they find a place where to stay at least six months during the, during the year. Uh, as Duncan mentioned, I mean, in 2007, with, with the Joint Action Plan, the, the, the bilateral relation was focusing basically four, four different objectives. Uh, first of all, uh, fostering competitive and sustainable economies, protecting citizens, enhancing people-to-people -people contacts, and projecting partnership 
globally and also regionally. We can talk about different institutions, but we still have to work on many others in, in the coming future. The, the, the four most, most important, we can say, of course, is the, the Canada-Mexican partnership, which now also takes uh, 10 years. Uh, and, and this uh, unites public and private sector representatives uh, also, the, the other institution which is very important is the military-to-military -military dialogue and the military-to-political to, to dialogues that ensure co coherence between uh, the many direct interactions between our representative security agency and, and all the, the, the political issues that are taking place. The other institution is the, the Canadian-Mexican Consular Rapid Response Mechanism, established in 2007 and a, a range of international fora, such as the UN, OAS, TPP, G20, and others that allow us to work together and, and project our partnership regionally and globally. Uh, if we see the, the current situation, we, we can talk about the, the, uh, uh, the, the prime minister here in Canada, Stephen Harper, uh, his last visit was in, in uh, two years ago, uh, 2012 to the G20 meeting in Mexico. And, and Peña Nieto came to Ottawa just two days before the, his inauguration. So it's from the very beginning, it seems to me that there is a, it's a good chemistry between both of them. And, and we, we are in a perfect moment to start building a new relation in the coming meeting, which will be take place uh, this coming month. Mexico City first, and then the trilateral uh, area with Toluca the Toluca Summit. Uh, Canada and Mexico have great potential to build a strong, a stronger bridges between us, and not just in, in the bilateral terms, but also in the tri in trilateral and multilateral uh, arena. So I think we have to, th to start thinking in a different way uh, how to build the, the bilateral relation and how to start working together in those areas which we have common interest in the international arena. Uh, we have an excellent level of understanding politically, socially, and culturally, uh, and we have many different mechanisms of cooperation, but it seems to me that, as, as Duncan mentioned, we still have to learn a lot about the Canadians, as the, the Canadians have to learn a lot of, about Mexicans. Of course, there are many different kinds of, of exchanges, bilateral trade and investment between the two countries reached uh, 35, uh, almost 35 and a half billion by the end of uh, the two years ago. And in July last year, Mexico exported 34% to, to Quebec, uh, 5.44 to, to Alberta, and 0.1 to Ontario. And, and this increased from, from, the, from the other year but also it was reduced in British Columbia and uh, Saskatchewan. Uh, we can see that uh, it's been like a, a very, very tough relation some years, but uh, some other times it, it's reduced either be, uh, because of the, the economic crisis or because there's no, no e uh, enough interest on how to deal with Mexicans. So we, I see that there are many different challenges now that we have to face. The first one is that uh, we should build and an, an renew a, a Canadian-Mexican partnership, first of all, and st starting not on, on a trilateral basis, but just a bilateral one, and do much more to encourage labor mobility, investment promotion, and, and academic mobility between both countries. Uh, unleash the, the, the potential synergies with the growing people-to-people -people linkages, providing the, the lifeblood of the relation, and adding the human texture to institutional framework. We have an opportunity now to reflect with this anniversary on the, their significance to the future of those two great countries and the bilateral relation. Revitalizing the, the Canada-Mexico relationship would also strengthen cooperation in North America and other settings. There is an urgent need to build a shared perspective between the two countries, which will allow us, both countries, to, to better assess the bilateral relation and the future uh, potential. Mexico is an important partner in North America and multilateral forum. 
However, the strategic definition of the relationship remains a work in progress. It's not done. Uh, while belonging to North America is what has made Mexico important to Canada, and it is also, I mean, this, this last past years, and it is also critical that Canada be able to, to, to visualize the potential of, of the relationship with Mexico and assess its strategic value in other settings as well. But it seems to me that there are uh, problems of perceptions of, on how to deal with the other. And first of all is Canada has identified Mexico as a strategic, a like-minded partner in, in the implementation of, of the American strategy, strategy alongside Chile and Brazil, and particularly in, in the area of security. But opportunities are often missed because of the lack of knowledge about the, the successful experience of bilateral relation that could be transferred to, to the region and because Mexico's leadership in the region is not fully known or understood. While Canadian uh, sees Mexicans as, as relevant partners, both in economy and political terms, it often puts it behind other emerging powers, such as the so-called BRICS, Brazil, Ro Russia, India, China, and South Africa, who attract more attention in terms of promoting greater economy and political alliances. In the eyes of the Mexicans, despite the fact of NAFTA has fostered greater commercial ties and, and some investment, a lot of, of it, it's still a puzzle as, as to why it has not been possible to maximize the, the benefits of the relationship with Canada and why the country is not considered more essential to Canadians. Since both countries are partners in NAFTA, there is an expectation that the relationship would or should be deeper and much more dynamic. There is also concern in Mexico about the emphasis on economic aspects of the relationship and ensuring to the future of the relation not to be limited to the dynamics of the market, to, other, to all of those other issues which are also important. And now, uh, to start thinking about the future, as, as I mentioned, I would like to focus on, on, on eight ideas, which I just gonna point here and leave you probably to, to work on them uh, in some other uh, uh, seminars or, or events. We, we've been working in, in, with some of them in, in Comexi in Mexico City, and I think there are, there are like some uh, nuclear ideas which might help us to start building the, the relation in the future. The first one is enhancing movement of, of people and, and improve competitiveness. And here I have a couple of questions. What, what are the technical and regulatory requirements and an approximate cost of more viable of, of the two options listed above? Which industries and sectors would be the, 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 the more beneficial? Could this be a model that could be applied to other areas such as academics? Moving the, bilater the bilateral trade agenda forward. Institutional coverage of free trade agreement with, with third countries would be possible as well. The second one will be the, the understanding and enhancing of state provincial linkages. Mexican states and, and Canadian provinces are engaged in a growing number of diverse state province agreements that expanded, amplify, and in some ways shape the overall bilateral relation. Subnational linkages are also a source of dynamic examples of cooperation. While having many benefits, this relation also poses new challenges and, and potential for, for the uh, unintended complications. My questions here will be what, what linkages currently exist by actors and, and by type? What are examples of success that can be used to inform or improve narratives of the Canadian-Mexican relationship? Essentially, we have two, two examples, uh, Jalisco and Alberta, uh, and also Querétaro. What have been the major pro uh, problems impeding and, uh, and issues as well as emerging best practices? and which are the ideas for removing impediment in Hessian linkages and establishing best practices. And the third one will be some, some, some idea, which for me is very important. Some, some Canadians, some Mexicans, and some Americans, they don't like it at all, which is the idea of North America, the, the North American space idea. This idea which was pushed very much by, by Robert Pastor uh, in, in the US, but also uh, by, the, by the Canadians in the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century with Porfirio Diaz, 
Uh, definitely, we, we have areas of common interest such as energy, climate change, trade, competitiveness, technology, automotive, air, uh, cars, of course, human security, regional security, and, and these all different areas need the new North American mindest that respond to, to the current challenges. There are some mechanisms that we already know, like Nexus and Sentry, but we can start building new, a new other kind of, of uh, mechanisms and instruments that might help us to build this idea of North America, which somehow we refuse to, to understand it in, in a very well way. The fourth one will be sustainable growth and competitiveness. Uh, th there are many uh, initiatives to re reinvigorate sustainable economic growth and competitiveness in, in, in the regional level. It seems to me still a long way to go. Exploration of opportunities in biotechnology sector to develop business linkages and joint research initiatives. And the best practice to improve the market and financial resources access, particularly in both countries. Uh, another one with, will be the, the, the area of energy security and environment, which to me, which, which is one of my main uh, research subjects as well, is very important. Uh, of course, there are exchanges on clean technology and, and generation of alternative energy sources, but we have to work much more on there. Recuperation of the, the, the oil fields, of course, uh, Alberta and oil sands, what, what we have in terms of shale oil and shale gas, we, we have to start working in a, in a different way in terms of research, production, and of course trade. Uh, there's definitely a, a good number of agreements, bilateral agreements between the US and Canada, and there are no agreements between Mexico and Canada. So it seems that to me that it's urgent to start building those agreements, otherwise we, we, will, be, we will not be part of this a region in, in, in a very competitive way. Not just US-Canadian uh, uh, ca agreements, not just trilateral agreements, but both um, uh, Mexican-Canadian agreements. Uh, and there are three more uh, uh, issues where I think we, we, we can build together, which is, of course, investment and financing uh, flows, security, which we have already a long way built, but we, we, we continue working on intelligence and so on. And the, and the final one, which will be, um, which is health, where we also have many different agreements, but we, that there's something in, that in, as part of NAFTA and as part of the bilateral relation, we can start building together many different mechanisms and instruments. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you again to all our uh, panelistas uh, for their excellent uh, presentations. I'm afraid we're short of time, so I'm not going to be able to take questions if we're going to save our coffee break. Um, so I just want to thank the panelists again and also uh, thank all the organizers of this event. Thank you. Okay, um, we're going to get started with the uh, with the second uh, panel, and um, I'm going to change the format a little bit. I, I know that a lot of people in the audience want to have the opportunity to be a little more interactive and ask questions, so I'm going to make two suggestions in terms of format. One is I will introduce everybody at once. Uh, secondly, we'll all remain at the table, and uh, the panelists have agreed to tighten their presentation so we can have more of an interactive experience because um, I, I, let's get behind the numbers. Let's get some, behind some of these issues that have been raised this morning. And um, I know there's a lot of interesting ideas here. So with that, let me introduce everyone. Um, again, we have a very distinguished group of uh, panelists this morning uh, for this second panel. Uh, to my far left is uh, Jennifer Jeffs who's the president of the Canadian International Council. Uh, Jennifer um, is a member of the editorial boards of the International Journal of Foreign Affairs for Latin America. She's a director of the Centro de Estudios y Programas Interamericanos, a director of the World Wildlife Foundation of Canada, member of the Advisory Council of the Canada-Mexico Initiative. And uh, some of her former positions include deputy executive director, 
at the Center for International Governance Innovation um, and was the founding director of the Centro de Estudios y Programas Interamericanos uh, based at ITAM in Mexico City, which uh, a number of you know very well. Um, to my right is uh, Silvia Nunez. Uh, Professor uh, Nunez is the director of the Center for Research on North America at uh, National Autonomous University of Mexico, where she also holds the position as a tenured researcher on U.S.-Mexico relations since 1989. And she teaches U.S. and Canadian studies at the School of Social and Political Sciences at UNAM and has been a visiting scholar at uh, Georgetown University and Michigan State, among others. So uh, she's a distinguished uh, member of the U.S.-Mexico Fulbright Commission uh, as well. Um, to my immediate left, is Andre Pluert, who is the uh, Dean of uh, uh, the Faculty of uh, Pu Public Affairs here at Carleton University. And uh, Andre has a very uh, distinguished uh, background uh, in economics. Uh, after joining Carleton, before joining Carleton in 2011, uh, he worked for more than a decade at the University of Alberta. Um, he uh, has worked at um, the University of Ottawa. In 1997, uh, he undertook an assignment as a Director of Economic Studies and Policy Analysis with the Federal Department of Finance, um, and then went back to the University of Alberta, and he also uh, had an assignment uh, in the government and was appointed Associate Deputy Minister for Energy. Uh, he is uh, a leading energy economist, which is a, a uh, a particularly interesting uh, sector to, to look at and hope we will have some discussion about. Um, and um, he's, of course, served on a number of numerous advisory committees uh, in private companies and within uh, universities. And um, uh, he's also uh, been involved in a number of very detailed aspects of, of energy economics, such as um, uh, royalty uh, reviews, which are, uh, of course, not... Um, inconsequential uh, when you start going into the details of, of energy policies. Uh, so with that, I'm going to ask um, Jennifer Jeffs to kick off, uh, and then we'll see how we move along. And, and as I promised, we will have some interactive questions as, as we go along. So Jennifer? Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you for the invitation. Thank you to the, uh, to the Mexican Embassy. And, uh, and welcome to the, uh, the Subsecretary from Mexico City. I'm so glad to, to see you here. Um, I guess I, I'll just start by saying that uh, internationally, the image of Mexico under the new president, under Pre President Enrique Peña Nieto, seems to have undergone quite a transformation in the recent, uh, in the recent months, um, in the short time he's been in office. Uh, internationally, the, the, the image of Mexico seems to have become much more positive. It's becoming um, a leading emerging country to watch. Uh, it's, a, it's, it's a country with a good story, the emerging middle class, the young people, the good demographics. The modern Mexico is, is a really, it's a great, it's a compelling story, but it's a story that we're not hearing enough of in Canada. Uh, unless you read the Financial Times, you haven't really noticed that Enrique Peña Nieto has made a big effort to be, to be photographed with powerful people, with, uh, with the Premier of China, with Obama. At the G20 meetings, he seemed to be taking every opportunity, and that was great to see, Mexico being uh, a power, an emerging power to watch. Um, in Canada, we hear a bit about the growing middle class, uh, the, the 40 million strong growing middle class, but we hear about it mostly from people who go to Mexico doing business, starting business uh, ventures, and who are surprised to come back and say, wow, they have this amazing sort of growing middle class. So I think there, there are stories to be told in Canada that we're, not, that we're not hearing. Our press is, unfortunately, the media seems to be obsessed with the gruesome stories and not focusing enough on the others. And I think there, there, are, there are certain things we can do about that. Um, we need more attention to Mexico, to how Mexican talent, uh, talent away from the stereotypes. Um, Canadians just don't know enough about Mexican architecture, for example, Mexican design, Mexican industrial design. Another thing that business people come back saying, wow, those factories are amazing. Um, then Mexican films. Um, Canadians are crazy about film festivals. Do we have a Mexican film festival in Toronto? That Toronto film festival has become huge. Uh, hot dogs, big thing. Mexican film industry is producing really cutting edge films that Canadians should know about. We should hear more about them. Literature, Mexican literature. 
I was, uh, I had the good fortune to be invited to interview uh, Carlos Fuentes, one of the last interviews he did at the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto, and it was completely sold out, no surprise. The executive director said she could have, she could have sold it out for a week, and it was, it was a wonderful interview, and he, it was covered by the media, and, she, you know, afterwards I said to her, so what's next, you know, who, who are you going to bring next? It was obviously very, very popular, so there are lots of opportunities for soft power, um, culinary festivals, there's so many things that we can do to tell a different story of Mexico, a different story and a story that's much more, uh, more compelling than, than the, the violence. Um, what's missing, so the, uh, Mexican entrepreneurship is something else that, uh, that we don't know enough about and that goes hand in hand with the emerging middle class and the younger population. Um, and what, do, what, does, what, does the, what does the entrepreneurial class need? They need financing and they need facilities. In other words, they need partners, good partners. So there are huge possibilities for collaboration with Canada. Um, and how does one get to the sort of the political will to make that happen? What is the most politically resident issue? Uh, jobs, job creation, future jobs. What are the future jobs? How do we know what's going to create jobs and prosperity in the future? These were topics of, of intense debate at Davos at the World Economic Forum last week. What is it? Is it going to be, what are going to be the drivers, technology? What's the next wave? What are the most salient issues? Um, two years ago, I did a report. Uh, the Canadian International Council did a report on uh, the international intellectual property regime. In the course of that, um, I visited uh, the World Intellectual Property Organization in Geneva, which oversees, which sort of guides patents and licensing uh, for countries, particularly developing countries, who are starting to work more closely with innovation. Uh, in the course of the research, I met the fellow who runs a sort of a sub-secretariat of WIPO, uh, who runs the Global Challenges Secretariat. And I thought that was, it was very interesting. So there are three global challenges that he has to deal with, the, those being the challenges that are, are basically f um, challenging humanity. Global health, global food security, and of course, climate change. Um, as these challenges become more serious, they're going to become big drivers of the economy. Future jobs are going to spring from these issues. Um, and those, those jobs are going to be found in industries and, and initiatives that, that we don't know any, we, don't, we can't even imagine yet. These are, going to be, these are going to be new areas that we haven't thought of. How are you going to figure out what they are? Um, through research. So both of our countries are working on issues of climate, health, food security, those three global challenges. Um, the knowledge and, and mo knowledge creation mobilization partnerships are important. These are priorities of both of our governments. Why are we doing it separately when we could be doing things like this together? These are opportunities that we can find as Canadians. Not just, I mean, I, the, the whole Fobesi thing, I have to say, that just drove me crazy when I found out about this big, first of all, the high-level economic dialogue being accompanied by the high-level education dialogue and, uh, and the partnerships that are growing between educational institutions and the big push to send Mexican students to the United States and the, the sort of the numbers, the, the forecasting numbers that they're putting out. Um, I mean, it's, it's wonderful. And we have in Canada, we've had, there's been a lot of press about the Brazilians and the Brazilians are sending out 100,000 uh, students in the next five years out into the world. 12,000 of those are going to come to Canada, which is fabulous. We have great absorptive capacity, not only in our universities, but also in our community colleges. But the whole Fobesi thing took place without Canada even knowing about it. Uh, I was told about it by a journalist in Mexico City who, who called me up to say, do you know if Canada's involved? You know, I called people in Ottawa, no, it, we're just, we're not involved in that. There are some initiatives to bring more Mexican students, but they should be coordinated. It would be great for Canada to get involved in the Fobesi initiative, more coordination. Those, that, that's the start, but I think the, the, the joint research programs are part of that, joint research programs, so one can flow to the other. Um, so going back to the joint research program, innovation, innovation on, uh, on global issues, wealthy and small country, a wealthy country like Canada, small country, small population, again, the, the growing middle class in Mexico is bigger than the entire population of Canada, and an emerging, developing country with great potential, what, what, great, what great partners to work on global issues. If Canada came up with some, some suggestion for what to do about climate change or what to do about food security, you can imagine it would be the, you know, the, the, the farmer's lobby or there would be accusations of self-interest somewhere in there. You can't 
accuse two countries with such different populations and different needs of self-interest. Their common need are, is, is, is attacking those global challenges. Um, so opportunities for partnerships. In Canada, the National Research Council, NRC, the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council, NSERC, and the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council are all now very strongly urging international partnerships. This is relatively new. In the past, partnerships were with the US and with the UK. Um, IDRC has been really pushing partnerships with developing countries. Um, they, they, they've actually identified Mexico as, as a good partner for particular global health initiatives, which is great. Uh, but there are so many other possibilities that could be followed through. Potential partners in Mexico include CONACYT, public and private universities, think tanks, IMCO, CDAC. There's so many opportunities that we could take advantage of. There's so many, we need some sort of institutionalized partnerships to make these happen. Um, the, so leveraging, so if we're leveraging resources, resor resources and research, creativity and talents, it just makes sense, especially for innovations in agriculture, in medicine, in energy. There are some examples of this already, but we could do so much more. By doing this, we can produce patents and licenses that actually produce prosperity. We have, a, we have this terrible example in Canada that, uh, that, that's sort of a, 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 an embarrassing secret about the development of canola in Saskatchewan. It was the Saskatchewan farmer that developed canola, and he couldn't somehow get the, the support to, uh, to, produce the, to produce the patent to, to, to actually to carry it through and ended up selling his company to the Americans. So our Western, our Western fa farmers now are, are needing to get licenses to produce canola from the state, from the company in the US that it got sold to. So Canada has experience in these things. Mexico has less. Canada can help. Mexico has the potential. It's a great partnership that only makes sense. When you think about where, where are the wealth creation opportunities going to come in the future, they're going to come from the biggest problems that we're facing and the, the, uh, the efforts and the investment that gets put into dealing with them. So examples, I mean, I'll just go through these very quickly to, to keep my time short. Um, energy, obviously, I think my other, my other uh, panelists are going to talk about energy, so I won't really go into it, but it does provide really rich fodder for energy research, clean extractive technologies. We have, uh, and here's an, here's an area where industries and universities can work closely together. We do have an intellectual property sharing consortium amongst oil companies in Canada that was put together a number of years ago. Why don't we include some Mexican companies in that? We're all dealing with, with so many common, common issues now within the energy industry, whether it's, whether it's clean extractive technologies, whether it's shale gas, there, there are numerous opportunities there. Um, sustainable ecosystems. Uh, Mexico is one of the most diverse ecosystems on the, on, the, on the face of the planet. We do have uh, the, the World Wildlife Fund in Mexico and the World Wildlife Fund in Canada have a cooperative arrangement dealing with the butterflies, the, the famous monarch butterflies that migrate every year. It's a lovely arrangement. There's financing for it, and it's just one example of, this is something, again, on the soft power side, let's tell Canadians more about the ecosystem in Mexico, the conservation agenda, the conservation agendas of the two countries have a lot in common. Health. Um, Mexican health professionals, so many of them have been trained abroad, they have international experience. Um, the, it's, a, it's a large population and they're dealing with so many of the same issues as Canadians. IDRC has been funding a, uh, a program dealing with childhood obesity in Mexico. Why not have a, 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 a joint program? Childhood obesity, childhood diabetes, big problems in Canada as well. Again, legitimate partnerships, legitimate solutions, particularly legitimate because of the differences in the populations. The, uh, the SARS epidemic, there were examples of Canadian and, and Mexican, strong examples of cooperation. H1N1, same thing, Canadians were, they jumped in as soon as Mexico had that big issue. Global health issues, pandemics, um, medical, medical networks are really important and it's a natural one. So there are lots of health cooperation examples which I won't go through. Food security, uh, food security is a, the price of corn obviously affects Mexican society uh, very dramatically. Um, there is a, there's an initiative at a university in Man Manitoba for a corn substitute made from barley. So barley is very, is plentiful in Canada. 
They've been working on this. It's just a small group of researchers to make the, a healthy tortilla. Barley is much more healthy than corn, lowers cholesterol, does all these things. This is, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a good example. Here's somebody being innovative, and it could be, it could be a moneymaker. Um, so Canada has shown a commitment to research cooperation with other large developing countries, emerging companies with large populations. The Canada-India Scientific and Technological Cooperation Agreement promotes, uh, promotes research into alternate energy, sustainable environmental technologies, biotechnology, health, and disaster management. We don't have something like that institutionalized between Canada and Mexico. We need to institutionalize cooperative partnerships. The Canada-Brazil Framework Agreement for Cooperation on Science and Technology, that's relatively new. We've managed to do it with Brazil, but we haven't managed to do it with our NAFTA partner. There's something very ironic about that. So I think, again, going back to the uh, getting to know each other better, the education is, is, is fundamental. And I would say the, the influx of, of Mexican soft power, bring us, bring us your films, bring us your architecture, bring us your, your, uh, your poets. We, we need to hear more of them in Canada. Thank you, Jennifer. Um, Andre, can I, sure. can I ask you to, um, to be the next speaker, please? Thank you. And thank you for, uh, for inviting me to come here, and thank you to the Mexican Embassy for uh, helping us to organize this. I'll have a much, more, uh, much narrower presentation. I'm really going to focus on energy, and when I say energy, I'm going to largely focus on oil and gas. That's what I know a little bit better. It's been, over the years, very difficult for Canada and Mexico to have a very close energy relationship. And some of that has to do with the different perceptions of, what the, of the role of energy within the national consciousness of the two countries. So some of you will know that to, to, to Mexico and to the Me Mexicans' understanding of their nation and of their state, uh, energy and oil and gas in particular plays a very important role. Uh, right down from the Constitution to the petroleum law to setting up Pemex and Pemex's role within the country is something that really has no parallel in Canada. And given the very different structures that have followed in terms of the activities of the energy industries, it has proven very difficult to have a relationship because it's, it's, it can't be of equal partners at some stage because the conversation has to be so different. Historically, however, we have had the privilege and the less than privilege of, of both being neighbors of the United States. And therefore, having a huge energy consumer and, it's, and a huge energy producer next to us. And historically, Mexico has been an important supplier of crude oil to the United States. And so much so that if you go back, I'll say, 20 years, there were basically four key suppliers of crude oil to the United States. And it kind of rotated as to who was important and all that. And those were uh, Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, Mexico, and Canada. And in any kind of combination of the two, you could probably account for something that looked an awful lot like 80% of U.S. crude oil exports by the sum of these four players. What's happened since then is that Venezuela has effectively disappeared, quotation marks, as a major supplier of crude oil to the United States. Saudi Arabia is still present, and most of you would think is the largest supplier, but you know, as a Canadian, it hurts a little bit, but that's okay. Uh, but Canada has grown uh, both in terms of volume and in terms of, of presence and uh, share. Mexico has, has, has not done very, very much. If anything, the, the importance of Mexico has decreased both in terms of volumes and in terms of share of imports. This is despite the fact that the share of imports in the U.S. has been falling over time in crude oil. And this is widely expected to continue over the next while. So there's something different going on in the two, uh, in the two countries. The story of natural gas is a bit similar. In the 1980s and early 1990s, Mexico was seen as a huge potential supplier of natural gas to the United States. And there was a pipeline built that, that essentially connects 
markets and production areas in Mex northern Mexico and the southern United States. And the intended flow of natural gas in that pipeline was that it would take Mexican produced gas into the United States. Well, what's happened historically, right, is that the flow of the pipelines reversed. Mexico is now and has been for many years an importer of natural gas from the United States. One could say indirectly from Canada since basically, right, long story, you can see I'm a good Canadian. <laughs> and all of this occurred before shale gas in the U.S. And so the potential is still to change. Part of this, I think it's important to understand the role that Pemex has played in the, in the Mexican state, in the federal state of Mexico, but also as an energy player within that, the, the country. As, as you know, Pemex has been a very important source of revenue for the federal government of Mexico. And what ha that has meant is that there's not always a lot of cash available for Pemex to actually do things like explore and develop resources. And historically, Pemex has had a clear focus on crude oil and not natural gas. And so essentially, if you look at how the structure of the industry has been in Mexico, much more focused on oil, much more internal looking because the growth in the demand locally and really focused on the activities of Pemex, which is chronically short of cash to do what needs to be done if you want to expand production and chronically short of access to technology. We'll come to that in a minute. So basically all of this kind of sets us up that NAFTA arrives. Mexico chooses in some sense to become part of the North American economic space, but chooses not to become part of the North American energy market. So effectively that was the consequence of, of, of NAFTA and kind of the predictable essentially happened. Until about 2013, and we'll, I'm sure you've no doubt talked about this already, uh, there had been some tentative steps to open up the, the Mexican energy indust industry and to bring it closer to the North America, to its North American partners. Uh, and that has perhaps happened even more in electricity, which, we won't, which I won't talk about because that would take a lot longer. Uh, but there's been uh, one thing I want, because it'll come back in later, is to mention the creation of service contracts in the natural gas industry. A lot of hope, a lot of hope, a lot of hope, not a lot of action came out of all of this. They were seen widely as too restrictive by foreign investors, too complicated, too insecure. Not much has happened as a result of that. So overall, however, what's, what's interesting is that Mexico has a huge potential in terms of natural gas, crude oil reserves. We don't know a lot because there's not been a lot of exploration uh, in Mexico. So there's, but the form, there's nothing in the Gulf of Mexico, for example, that says that the, the hydrocarbon formations follow the border, right? Uh, essentially, you know, it's not just to say, well, you know, it's okay on the U.S. side, but there's really nothing on the Mexican side. We don't know what there is on the Mexican side. Not been a lot of action. The potential, however, is quite important. But Pemish has no cash. It has no access to the right technology. And so the industry continued on this decline. Now, this is a social choice. And, you know, you can keep the resources in the ground. You can restrict access to the Mexican state. You can do all of that. I'm not trying to say that one way is better than the other. It is a choice that a society makes. Societies have the right to make these choices. There are consequences, and that's the way it is, right? But now what seems to be happening in Mexico is that there are efforts to change the balance a little bit with the views of and, and, and I would argue perhaps to integrate more in the North American energy market. The constitutional changes that have been discussed, eventually proposed, the changes to the petroleum law that would have to follow and that sort of thing. And effectively to allow non-state, including participation in the oil and gas industry, including foreign investment, risk contracts, we can talk about that later, production contracts, that sort of thing. Uh, would be are part of what people are considering now. So, will things change? Is this going to be the natural gas service contracts all over again of a long story, 
put it in place, not much happens because not much really is meant to happen. So I think that's going to be an important question of the future. Now, again, I'm not questioning Mexic the, the right of Mexico and of Mexicans to decide not to be part of that game. This is not the point. I want to highlight three things before I pass on. First one is that there are two largely unheralded successes of the, on the energy aspects of NAFTA, which I bet you most of you have not heard of, which I think have been quite important and, or interesting. The first one is that shortly after NAFTA, the federal energy regulators of Canada, the US, and Mexico started talking to one another. That was revolutionary. Between Canada and the US, the FERC and the NEB had always had a bit of a conversation, never involved the regulatory agencies, uh, federal regulatory, energy regulatory agency in Mexico. Completely revolutionary. They're actually talking to one another, trying to understand. Imagine if you're going to get natural gas, for example, from Canada down into the US, down into Mexico, or the other way around, it'd be kind of nice that the pipelines are built to handle the same quality of natural gas, for example. So those types of things, really important. The second thing, which is, you have to be an energy policy wonk, I suppose, to care, so you have to understand that, is that the very early after NAFTA was established, there was a committee that was put together of high-level officials in the three areas. One of their first projects was to put together a picture of energy statistics in the three countries. For the first time, they actually sat down and made sure that they had comparable measures of things across the three countries. They produced a report. I still have a copy. <laughs> it was fabulous because it allowed this compare. All of a sudden, you had a picture of all of this. It included where the natural gas pipelines were, where the oil pipelines were, where the electricity transmission lines were, that kind of thing. Absolutely valuable to researchers, to policy analysts, to industry, to government officials. I don't know that they ever produced a second edition. It was a great piece of work. Finally, within NAFTA, I think as has been highlighted before, there is a lot of potential for much closer cooperation between Canada and Mexico on environmental issues and especially on energy and the environment. And I think I wouldn't be working too hard on getting our in energy sectors lined up too closely, but I think we have a lot of potential to work together on energy and the environment. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. And um, I think everyone looks forward to coming back and, and having some interactive discussion on that. But first, uh, let me turn to uh, Silvia Nunez and, and ask her for her comments. Thank you very much. It is a great honor for me being here and have the opportunity to give you my comments about how do we see the relation with Canada from the Center on, uh, of, of, of Research on North America from UNAM. Uh, firstly, let me begin by thanking Mexico's uh, foreign ministry, uh, uh, represented here by the Mexican ambassador to Canada and the Undersecretary for North American Affairs, who were invited, invited me to, for this uh, very distinguished um, commemoration. I would also like to extend my gratitude to the authorities and faculty of Carleton University for their kind welcome. I will begin my comments with an Arabic proverb, proverb that I think expresses the reason that brings us together. The proverb, the proverb says that for every, every glance behind us, we have to look twice to the future. After 70 years, it is imperative that we take advantage of the opportunity to reflect on the journey we have taken together, pondering the achievements and difficulties that undoubtedly point to important commonalities between our two great nations that stem for their vocation for peace and cooperation. 
while the facts of the economy tell us that trade have been the area that have concentrated our attention in our relations. From my perspective, the negotiations and entry into effect of NAFTA two, days, two decades ago showed that the ties between us have become more complex because of the influence and visibility of new actors in the public sphere. This, together with government and business, have contributed since then to a stimulating interaction in key areas like the academy and civil society organizations, not to mention the interaction among subnational governments. Allow me to say that I'm a hopeless optimist. This comes of working day to day with young people at Mexico's National Autonomous University, the largest public university in the country with more than 300,000 students. This contact with young people forces me to recognize the diligent critics of our bilateral relationship when they say that it has lost dynamism and to emphasize that the framework of institutional cooperation must go much further. My comments today will focus on looking at the specific issues that illustrates a positive alliance between Mexico and Canada, as well as others that I think we should pay more attention to, regardless of any differences or those thirst upon, upon us by the asymmetry in our levels of development and the demographic contrasts between our countries. In today's world, both our countries are known for the opposition to protectionism, their support for free trade, and particularly for their dedication to strengthening democratic governance. From these flows, among other things, the importance our respective governments give to access to information and, and that we agree on the need to work together on issues of security and justice to promote development, human rights, the protection of personal data, and cultural and educational exchange in order to achieve multilateral cooperation. Based on a constructive di dialogue, I think it is important that all of us who are directly involved in strengthening relations between Mexico and Canada should be capable of defamiliarizing the familiar and making familiar what is unknown. As the Polish scholar Sigmund Bauman says, this means that beyond agreements about the economy, trade, and politics, deepening our social and cultural interaction is indispensable for continuing to cultivate trust between our nations. The 2010-2012 Mexico-Canada Joint Action Plan has emphasized sustainable development of our economies as a model for fostering competi competitiveness. But clearly, given the relevance for improving the well-being of the population of both countries, issues like public health and gender equality should be pushed forward through many more actions than those carried out until now. With regard to this, Canada's collaboration can be particularly significant in helping to close the gender gap in Mexico. Just as an illustration, we should note that Canada occupied the 11th place on the 2012 Human Development Index and Mexico 61st. In terms of the Gender Inequality Index, Canada is in 18th place and Mexico 72nd. Our respective adolescent fertility rates were 11.3 for Canada and 65 0.5 for Mexico. In, in, in 2012, Canada, Canada's legislature included 28 women and Mexico 36. In terms of women in the workforce, 62 out of every 100 Canadian women had a job outside the home, and in Mexico, that number was 49.6. I would like to insert a parenthetical comment here. Opening the way for promoting the study of Canada in Mexico 
has been a rocky but highly gratifying road. At the Center for Research on North America at UNAM, we have never ceased our efforts to, to broaden and strengthen our research projects about Canada, recognizing their structural weakness 19 years ago when we began. We have designed mechanisms to systematically evaluate our progress and have managed to carry our 25 academic activities over the, la uh, over the last four years linked to initiatives that include the study of Canada as one of the cross-cutting themes. We truly understand how important is our, is our relation with Canada and we are convinced that only with a long-time vision we will see that our seed has bloomed. Right now, for example, we are working with Dr. Jonathan Crush from the Balsili School of International Affairs on a joint initiative on migration and food security. The emphasis we have put on the study of Canada includes research, teaching, and dissemination. This has been, thank this has been thanks to several factors, among them, the successful Canadian government efforts to obtain funds from the development program grant in some years, which gave us the opportunity to enjoy the participation of several renowned Canadian academics. Another factor is the trust placed in us by the former Canadian ambassador to Mexico, Guillermo Eryshinsky, and current ambassador, Sara Radeki, who have participated directly in some of our activities. The CISAN, was also favored with the collaboration of the filmmaker, because the, the film is one of, uh, we have a research project on uh, film, the filming industry in Canada. When we hosted the Honorable Jean Daniel Lafont, who headed a forum at UNAM on the, importer, on the importance of art and diversity in contemporary society. Co-organized with the Canadian Embassy in late 2009, in the framework of the official visit to Mexico of then Governor Mikael Jan. Without any doubt, allowing our, our audience of professors and students to get to know these public figures has been very stimulating for them and for all of us. Based on our experience, we have been able to verify that despite its contradictions, NAFTA sparked the interest of Mexico's researchers, professors, and students in learning more and thinking, thinking more about Canada in the framework of the agreement. This was decisive in multiplying intellectual exchanges with our Canadian peers who felt the same way. It is in this context that with the support of the Canadian Embassy, our institution created the Margaret Atwood and Gabrielle Roy Chairing Canadian Studies. The chair has created a space of academic excellence to foster high-level teaching and interdisciplinary research where literary issues and reflection about the trans tra transcendence of translation have been the outstanding notes. However, the sharpening of today's economic crisis has surprised us with Canada's dis distancing itself from the model of cultural diplomacy that used to characterize it. We think that both our governments should go back to that model as one of the strategic axes for relau relaunching our bilateral relationship. Because culture includes language, for the new generations of Mexicans, learning English is one of our educational system's priorities, not only because of its importance in today's knowledge so society, but also because speaking it will Speaking it, it will strengthen our ability to interact with our northern neighbors. Promoting the learning of Spanish based on, a, on our geographical proximity, together with the growing number of Spanish-speaking immigrants in Canada, gives us a glimpse of the horizons for bridging the language gap. In a global world characterized by increasing insecurity, Mexico and Canada are forced to face the challenge of deepening our ties in the search of mutually beneficial answers. It is here that it's essential 
to bolster education as a key for building the future. Today, Canada is one of the three main destinations for Mexican tertiary level students following the United States and Spain. Let us not forget, however, that motivating young people is not a simple task. That's why I am continually asking myself what capacities we must reinforce in teachers and professors at the secondary and tertiary level so that the young people of Mexico and Canada can grow to truly know one another. What tools do we already have to do this? And what others should we create together? If we take into account that the dynamics of our era are stamped with the velocity of events, of the visual media, and with how we can not only move from one place to place, but even communicate instantaneously using a kind of micro language, Twitter, we have to recognize that we are experiencing a scientific, technological, and cultural revolution. Some thinkers today are already warning that the new generations tend to disregard the past, defining themselves mainly by the road they want to take, but without asking themselves where they came from and how, and how it is that they arrive where they are. From this stems the importance of returning to the historical significance of our bilateral relationship. Beyond these seven decades, decades, taking the moment to propose that this task be carried out by a binational research team. I am sure that with more joint education, educational research and dissem dissemination projects, we will contribute to creating synergies among the new generations. Even though they come from different cultural milieus, they will be nourished through their interaction to move toward building empathy. Reclaiming this shared history, regardless of its length and knowing the history of the other, situates us at the center of humanist thought. As a result, those of us who have the good fortune of being able to contribute to the for formative education of young people interested in the study of international relations in general, and in particular, in the ties between Mexico and Canada, have the obligation to fight ignorance of the past, since it is not only the result of a lack of information, but of indifference. This makes it essential that we move ahead toward a future that must be better than, the, than, the what, than what we have known before. I think that Mexico and Canada undoubtedly have unfinished business in terms of exploring new formulas and stepping up our commitments, forging a strategy so that the new generations of both countries can learn about the other and understand each other better. More scholarships for students or new internship, internship programs will always be important, but never enough <coughs> to solve the imbalances between both countries if they are not accompanied by policies that encourage a larger number of young Canadians to go and study in Mexico and guarantee that Mexican or Canadian talent can swell the ranks of the human capital Mexico needs for its development. I could not close my remarks without saying that any plan for continuing to positively broaden our relation, relationship has to take into account the United States, since geography, trade, and human mobility have accelerated our interdependence in many ways, many of which are irreversible. However, it is worthwhile underlining the premise that the relationship that is about to celebrate its seven, it's celebrating today its seventh decade, has one fund fundamental attribute in this context. The boon of having arisen without being darkened by the shadows of power and domination of one over the other, or the shadows of resentment or discrimination. We Mexicans and Canadians share common values like hard work and solidarity, and are foreordained by our proximity to be unable to turn our backs to each other. 
I think congratulations are in order because Mexico and Canada find themselves at a decisive moment to be able to deepen relations in the framework of such a significant anniversary. Regardless of the agreements that the leaders of both countries, Enrique Peña Nieto and Stephen Harper, come to, Canadian and Mexican society must demand firm steps forward toward the construction of prosperity. And we must also not forget, as Billy Brandt said, that international cooperation is too important to live exclusively in the hands of governments. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, Silvia. I, I would li now like to open the floor for some questions and interactive discussion. And I would like to ask the previous panelists if you could come to the front and, and Laura so that everyone can participate in the, uh, uh, in the discussion. I, I think there's some chairs up here as well. So um, I'm going to uh, try and you know, if you can, keep your uh, questions succinct so we can maximize the number of interactions that, that we have. Uh, so please, I see there's a first question in front of me. Stephen Clarkson from the University of Toronto. Uh, en tant que citoyen d'un pays en voie de sous-développement, je voudrais surtout remercier le gouvernement du Mexique pour son aide financière à, à nous autres pour organiser ce congrès. Et je dois dire que j'ai honte de prendre note du fait qu'il n'y a aucune représentation de mon gouvernement ici. I've just got a comment and a question. If, if Teresina is coming to the front, I want to ask her a question. But the comment <coughs> was just uh, twofold. One is I'm very happy to hear the second panel saying positive things about possibilities in the relationship. But I must say I'm more of a, uh, on the, wavelength of Duncan Wood in feeling how disastrously the relationship has been handled at the government level. And I'd just like to add to what Duncan said, something that wasn't remarked on because it didn't happen, but in the year 2000, uh, Robert Pastor was mentioned, in the year 2000, uh, President Fox with Castaneda and with the uh, intellectual support of Robert Pastor proposed a solidarity, some kind of solidarity initiative for North America. Canada then, under Chrétien, gave that idea the back of his hand. Mr. Martin, later liberal prime minister, also rejected that idea. And uh, so I think we have to acknowledge that there's a bipartisan uh, capacity to ignore the importance of Mexico to Canada. Um, my question is, is, has to do though with an aspect of the privatized relationship, which is the interesting fact that Canada is a dominant exporter of mining capital to Latin America. And my question for Teresina, she's there, is, because this is her area of, of expertise, is to what extent the privatization of international economic law in foreign investment protection agreements um, encourages good corporate behavior or bad corporate behavior on the part of Canadian companies investing in mining in Mexico. Thank you. Would anybody like to address the mining question? <laughs> okay. It's a tricky question. When I was uh, preparing my paper, I start to think a little bit if I have to say about it or no. But thinking that uh, finally this is a, a gathering organized by the Mexican Embassy in Mexico, I prefer to skip a little bit the subject because I understand that uh, it's quite controversial. The problem is that an academic asked me this, and I am an academic. So I'm sorry, but I have to answer, okay? <laughs> and I think uh, the Mexican diplomats could understand my, my situation. Okay, first of all, I think um, this uh, 
subject, Canadian mining companies going and, in, and invest in Mexico, is a, a quite new experience for us. First of all, because uh, only until 1996, uh, the Mexican government makes some change about uh, foreign investment, and secondly, about the uh, you know uh, mining sector, not all the natural resources, only uh, mining sector. I remember when the NAFTA negotiations, that in fact the the Canadian companies were knocking the door and insisting that uh, it was very very important to open the the energy sector at whole. In that moment, the Mexican government decided to say no and wait for, for a, another moment. The point is that uh, for all these 20 years, the Canadians always insisted in that point. In fact, the, can the Canadian companies were particularly interested in the energy sector because uh, in that sector they have a a very important skill. Finally, the Mexican government opened the, opened the door and the Canadian companies entered quite quickly. Now, the most important uh, foreign investment in mining sector is Canadian, more than uh, US investment and Chinese investment and so on. So, uh, it was something interesting that finally it was um, a second recovery between Canadians and Mexicans because it was absolutely new. We never had Canadians working in that field and it is, I think it was uh, quite hard. On the other hand, the, the Canadian government started to be worried about the, the behavior of uh, many companies in Mexico. And so they introduced uh, this uh, subject about um, corporate social responsibility. That in my opinion is a shame. Sylvia mentioned a little bit, but I take advantage and I, and I would say something. It's a shame that uh, that Canadian government take so much money that was always going to economic development, not only in my country, in many uh, other countries. And so all the money from economic development and for public policy that it was support Canadian studies abroad, all this money move to this subject, promote um, um, corporate responsibility. I am not against corporate, res uh, co corporate responsibility, but um, just think about it. For so many years, this country, by taxes, invest in a, you know, in the promotion of Canadian identity abroad, because people like me are here thanks to, to this investment. It was, you know, an investment about knowledge, about culture. And like me, like Susana, and uh, like uh, Sylvia, there are many, many foreign pe pe people that work on Canadian studies since the last 20 years. And suddenly, the government decided to take all this money and encourage the, the, Canadi uh, the Canadian mining activities, and it is a big confusion because this is not economic development. Okay, I'm, I'm going to move on yes. so others can yes. uh, ask some, some, some no, other questions. You ask okay. me. Yeah, thank you. Okay. I, I, you I'm ask just, me. I'm conscious of the time. I, I did talk about <laughs> it's this. Not, I have the hard job well, of trying to floor. open the floor to, uh, to a number okay. of others as well. So it's a question of time, not of interest, believe no, me. No, no, it's, it's uh, okay. Thank so you. So I, I see there's a question at the back of the room. Thank, thank you, Randy. I'm Fernando from the Embassy of Mexico. When we uh, think of governments getting, uh, countries getting together, we, governments usually think about strengthening or creating institutions. But Duncan and, and Jennifer uh, 
pointed out something that I, I think was quite interesting. Duncan said, let's build, build human capital. And Jennifer said, let's use soft power. Let's use culture. And it seems to me that after 70 years, the message is we should start to get to know each other a little better. So I want to ask uh, both Duncan and Jennifer, um, what do we need uh, looking at the future, looking at the next 70 years, to have a Mexico-Canada 2.0 relation? Um, it's clear that NAFTA was great to uh, create uh, economic growth. But can we think about a new North America in the next uh, years to create growth, but also to create uh, uh, jobs and inclusion? I, I'm going to add a, a supplement to that question, which flips it in the economic sense. We've talked a lot about North America. Now, we all know in this room that <coughs> there's a neighbor called the United States where Canada exports 70% of its product. Mexico, uh, more or less the same. Uh, and as well, uh, we rely on the US for FDI. In the case of Mexico, some 50%. In the case of Canada, I'm not exactly sure what the number is anymore, but it's, it's the first country. So my question is, in terms of the, uh, you know, the, the commonality, and I hear there's a lack of policy willingness from the government side to take this trilateral relationship further. Let me be provocative. Isn't it because we put Canada and Mexico both, both put our economic interests first and what we really care about is exporting to the US, both countries, and getting foreign direct investment from the US? So I just kind of leave that as a provocative question to kind of stir things up a bit. Okay, thank you. Jennifer, you wanted to take one or two or all of those on, so go for it. <laughs> um, okay, I think, uh, I think we, do, we do need more institutionalization of partnerships, definitely. As I say, we, do, we, don't, we, we need science and technology partnerships. We need institutionalized research partnerships. I think that that's, that's really necessary, and I think those can be, those can be pushed by universities. Uh, in terms of what we need um, to get to know each other, can the Canada-Mexico 2.0, I like that. I think that's a, that's a great way of putting it. Two things. I think we need uh, two things that come to mind immediately to the top of my head. Mexican studies programs, I don't think we have any. We may have one very small one. We need them. We need them in major cities. We need them in Ottawa. We need them in Toronto. We need them in Calgary. We need them in Vancouver. Absolutely necessary. That's also a way to bring in visiting scholars, bring in visiting lecturers, bring in cultural figures. The other thing that I think we really need, and I've been trying to, to push this uh, in Toronto, is we need, I was, in, uh, I was in Washington a few weeks ago, and there was a dinner, I was a guest at a dinner at the Mexican Cultural Center, and it was fantastic. What a beautiful building. What a great, what a great piece of architecture. What a great place, venue to have events. We need something like that. I know there is some kind of a center in, in Montreal. We need one in Toronto. It's the business people you want to capture. Um, we need somewhere for, for visiting artists to come, for shows, for talks, for people to rent out to have events, to, uh, Mexican art, full of Mexican art. I think that's, something like that would go a long way to making Mexico more than a land of, of, uh, of drug cartels and beheadings in Toronto. Duncan? Just to respond to, um, to Fernando's question and your agent provocateur role, um, I, th I think there's, th I mean, we could all come up with a long list of things that we could do to actually strengthen the relationship and get it to 2.0, or maybe we should actually just jump straight to 3.0 because 2.0 is kind of last decade, isn't it? Let's face it. So, you know, and thinking about that, you know, I, I like the idea of, uh, of cátedras, of chairs in Mexican studies. I think that helps in universities. But let's face it, a lot of uh, what happens in the world today isn't about physical presence necessarily. 
there are uh, many ways that we could actually create research networks and, uh, and joint programs across borders without actually moving people around too much. Um, one of the exciting things I think is going on in the US-Mexico relationship right now is you know, looking at uh, student mobility, but not just student mobility in the sense that they go to study for one semester or two semesters in the United States or in Mexico and then go home. They go for a short period of time. They make the contacts. They establish a peer group. They go back home and then they continue the conversation through social media, through webcams, through you know, uh, 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 Skype conferences, etc. Those are things that we can do, but we need to have somebody to actually take the lead on that, to set them up in universities across the country. Um, in terms of having uh, uh, funding for higher education exchanges between either Mexico and Canada or trilaterally in North America, I think that's where the, the three governments need to come up with the seed capital to make that happen. But then the private sector needs to kick in. And there's never been a better time to ask the private sector for this kind of thing. Because as I pointed out in my remarks, the private sector is seriously worried about where they're going to find the talent in the future. Look at what happened in the debate in the United States last year over comprehensive immigration reform. Who were the private sector firms that were leading the charge? It was firms like Google and Facebook because so much of their daily activity is focused on finding the human capital from around the world just to satisfy the, the needs that they have on a daily basis. I have a, a friend in, in, in Austin, Texas, who dedicates his, his, uh, his, his days to recruiting Mexicans f to work for Google. And that's his job. He sits in Austin, Texas, and he goes through the, the resumes, and he calls up, and he calls up headhunters, and he finds them. But he has you know, counterparts throughout the company who are doing the same thing in India, in China, et cetera, et cetera. These are things that I, I think we really need to, you know, to focus on, is to say you know, the private sector needs people. And where are we going to get those people on? They need to now put up their money, but they won't do it on their own. Somebody needs to facilitate. And we've seen this time and time again. Um, and in response to your, uh, uh, to your a provocation, Randy. Yes, the United States is going to take up a lot of the attention. It should do, let's face it. But we talk a lot about China. How important is China to Canada versus Mexico to Canada? You know? I mean, how much do we sell to, to China versus how much we sell to Mexico? How much do we sell to invest in China versus how much we invest in, in, in Mexico? This is a much more important relationship, and we ignore it, and we have a completely one-sided um, semi-xenophobic uh, uh, perspective on, on Mexico, I think, in Canada. And it's the responsibility of the Mexican government, the Mexican uh, diplomatic service, to change that, I think. But, you know, we need to get over this. It's that, you know, this idea that Mexico is just down there and it's a great place to go on vacation. It's a powerhouse. And those of us who have visited and have traveled around the country are just so impressed. Listen to what the head of Bombardier says about when, wh wh why he invested there. He says, I went down there because it's cheap labor. I'll be honest with you. But when I got there, I found incredible human capital there, people who were innovators, people who changed our management processes and our production processes, not just in Querétaro in central Mexico, but throughout the world. That's what Mexico has to offer. Thank you. OK. I'm going to give any students in the room a last chance to ask a question. <laughs> Thank you. Here we go. Here's one of our fine students in political science. Great. Go for it. You step up to the mic. So a few of the speakers emphasized the importance of increasing. Closer to the mic. OK, sorry. Better? Yeah. OK. So a few of the speakers emphasized the importance of increasing exchanges of ideas and culture and people between Mexico and Canada. So that being said, how likely is NAFTA to evolve into a setup more similar to the European Union regarding freedom of movement across borders? Good question. Thank you for that. How likely is NAFTA to evolve into a European Union-like model for uh, movement of people across borders? Who wants to tackle that one? You want to tackle that one? Go for it. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> I work for the Mexican Embassy, and I, I wanted to answer that question. Thank you for the question. And uh, where is the beef? The beef is how can we become competitive together in the region? By the way, this is going to be like 
Let me tell you. Yeah, you one get, thirty like seconds. Tank, okay. You get the beef is seconds. in competitiveness. <laughs> the competitiveness is not thinking in three labor markets or three energy markets or three technology markets. It's one single labor market across the region. So because there is, uh, we have many engineers and economic historians, but the economists have a theorem. When you have, in the condition of free trade, cost of factors of production tend to equalize. If we can equalize the cost of factors of production, including energy, which is a very important relevant factor of production in the 21st century, if we can have one single labor market, that implies uh, your question, free freedom of movement. If we have freedom of movement of, uh, of labor that has uh, some value to the economy, then we equalize the cost of production. Then we become competitive, and that's where the BB is becoming competitive vis a vis the rest of the world, not amongst ourselves. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that. Now, uh, I'm afraid we're running a little bit short on, on time, but um, speaking of 3.0 and uh, digital economy, I, I find that since Ambassador Suarez uh, has um, arrived here in Ottawa, uh, uh, an energy that uh, is going to take us way beyond that. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think we're going to get into plasma energy beyond 3.0 with, with the kinds of efforts that he's been making in such a short time, uh, not only in bringing this together, but many other types of initiatives. And he's been sitting quietly, uh, but he, is a, he and his staff, in fact, have been instrumental in pulling this together. So I want to ask Ambassador Suarez to, to come up and, and, and say a few final words, if you, if you can, Ambassador. Thank you, thank you very much. I know it's uh, lunchtime, and I think there's very little to say after uh, all the great speeches that have been given here. Nevertheless, I do want to, to start on behalf of my colleagues who work very hard at this, to start by expressing our sincere thanks to Carleton University for hosting, for hosting what I consider uh, the first veritable intellectual feast. It is the first to initiate the celebration of the 70th anniversary of our relationship. Uh, since I'm a bit of a frustrated amateur historian, I looked at many of the books, and I, I noticed that some of the pioneers who have written on this topic uh, uh, published books here under the name of Carleton University. Monsieur Daudelin, Mr. Dosman, Stephen Randall, although he's from Calgary, Professor Keb Keblack as far back as 1995, and I regret that Professor Conrad is no longer here with us to speak together uh, with, our, with our friend, uh, uh, Gutierrez Assis. Um, uh, thank, th thank you, uh, President Ronti, for her, your hospitality, and to Dean Andre Plourde, uh, as well as to Laura uh, McDonald, and to you, uh, to Randy, who helped so much in putting all these intelligent people together. Uh, today, we appreciate those, I would say, we particularly appreciate those that have accepted the invitation to warm from warm, sunny Mexico to defy in truly Spartan fashion the, the challenges of this most severe Ottawa winter. I must say that one of the main obstacles to the relationship between Mexico and Canada are the very few air flights and the horrible air flights that connect Mexico. It's really, it's really something, really a penance to take uh, pra practically the only flight, which is Air Canada, to come, to come here, not to mention the lack of competitive prices that they have. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I would like particularly to appreciate the visit of uh, my very good friend on the Secretary for North America, Sergio Alcocer, who really comes here to be with us today, but I think to work at the forthcoming agenda of the bilateral visit, I'm sure he got many ideas here today. Uh, in order, unfortunately, I'm, a, I'm a more an economist than an engineer. I, I was thinking that engineers build bridges and Mexican, the economists spend a lot of time discussing, uh, discussing what is the reason for the bridge. <laughs> never, and they never get, uh, they never agree, uh, not to mention the funding of the bridge. But anyway, uh, so uh, my envy to the engineers. Uh, um, well, he was a great keynote speaker. Uh, well, it's a great pleasure to see again Professor Silvia Nunez from the very prestigious North American Research Center of, of AUNA, and Dr. Uh, Gutierrez Hasses, which I have not had the pleasure of meeting personally. I've heard, I have read you, uh, and I have learned uh, very much from, from reading your articles and listening to hear you today. 
Susana Chacon is both a very distinguished professor and researcher, and I must highlight that as a director of the, of the uh, prestigious uh, foreign policy, Mexican, the Mexican edition of the, of, the, of the Foreign Policy Journal, uh, she has published and it's very attractive. The first for this issue for this year has a very attractive coverage uh, of the 70 years of the anniversary. It's somewhere in there uh, with very interesting, uh, uh, very interesting uh, articles. I was delighted to hear uh, Professor uh, Duncan, Duncan Wood. Okay, I will make three final reflections, one on the past, one on the friend, one on the present, and another on the future. On the past, I think it's one point I would like to highlight is that the years 1944 are important, 1994 is also important, but our relationship began many, many years before. I would like to underline uh, three periods. Uh, I have spoken a lot with uh, our friend, the Spanish ambassador who, who is who was here today, uh, and I think it's noteworthy uh, to speak about the role of the Mexican explorers along the Pacific coast of Canada uh, in the Vancouver area, Captains uh, Narvaez and Perez, who in the 1780s predated and in fact gave technical assistance to Captains, Captain Vancouver particularly in, giving, in laying out maps for him, uh, who traded with the First Nations, particularly the Haita Nation. Uh, I would like to highlight also, as has been mentioned, the degree of activity during the Porfiriato. Obviously, it was really a great, in the sense, a golden age in energy, finance, and infrastructure, the same topics that are obviously here today. But I, I came across something which I contribute to, history, to, to the history, which is really something uh, remarkable. And I, somebody that's really the, the son of, of, of somebody that's actually saw this. Uh, in, 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 19, in 1922, uh, there was the, the establishment of what's called, in 1922, the Rio Conchos Hydraulic Dam in Chihuahua. Who was the project manager of the hydraulic uh, Rio Conchos Dam in Chihuahua? None other than prime, for what was then later Mackenzie King. Mackenzie King was the project manager of the Rio Conchos Hydraulic Plant Manager uh, in 1922. I think that probably made good luck for him to later become the longest serving <laughs> prime minister, I would hope. But also I would like to highlight, you know, uh, that, you know, asylum is a topic and uh, social tolerance and social help. Well, President, uh, President Obregón, again in, in the 20s, uh, showing a great deal of religious tolerance, welcomed the Mennonites in Chihuahua also, giving them uh, full benefits in religious education and marriage rights. Probably we had something like 200,000. I think they have contributed somewhat to the political landscape in the United States and probably also here. Uh, the third area is obviously the, the area uh, from the Second World War uh, to 1994. And here I would highlight the era in which we actually shared very closely with the Canadian foreign policy on hemispheric policies. I think we should not remember that Mexico and Canada were the only two countries that established relations with the government of Fidel Castro all along, uh, without interruption, and therefore contributing in the in an enlightened sense to the long to long term to long term vision. But also, uh, uh, Premier Trudeau worked very much in, in this third way policy, the Cancun meeting, uh, the Cantadora peace efforts. On the present, um, in the 20 years since NAFTA. The obviously the economic relationship in trade, tourism, and investment, the figures have reached a phenomenal uh, 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 plateau. There, there's, uh, uh, there's, there's no doubt about it. Uh, I think here I will go a little bit. Uh, my, my wife's somewhere around here, and so, so, so I like very much the academic fora. In the academic fora, I try to stretch to the limit, becoming less of a diplomat and more of a, of a, of a academician. Well, in doing this, I would say, okay, it reached a, a great, a phenomenal plateau. But increasingly, it is clear that the relationship has lost dynamis, dynamism. It has become stagnant. Scholars, and biz, scholars, scholars here today and businessmen have pointed out this. It's, you spoke here of the unfinished agenda. I think we can certainly commemorate NAFTA. I think it achieved a lot. But I must say it has entered into a mature, into mature dignified old age. We would say in Spanish, tercera edad, uh, with flaws, limitations, and increasing wrinkles on their face. Uh, you can say it did not generate growth. A very noted Mexican scholar, Jaime Ross, mentioned, well, 
It's fantastic. We, we had, for 20 years, export-led growth, but with no growth. Uh, it did not correct inequality between regions, the north, the south, skilled versus skilled, large firm versus small and medium-sized firms. It is highly concentrated in a few sectors, mining, agriculture, energy, automobiles, and aeronautics, although it is true that, that very successful real production change have established, been established. The future. The 17th anniversary, I think, should serve as it has done here today to give food for thought and reflection. I think the real challenge is to achieve and define a long-term strategic vision that is both deeper and broader. I think this new vision can be launched in the forthcoming visit by Prime Minister Harper and later on this year by President Peña. The conception of a dynamic and competitive North American region oriented towards, I underline, growth, employment generation, greater equity, converges between income levels, the unfinished agenda, but such a vision requires, I think, very much intellectual support from the academic community. The think tanks and universities have the substance and the credibility to do it. Uh, it's clear that it, we, uh, Secretary Schultz, please, uh, freezing the road, it's in, it's in North America's an economic powerhouse. Well, let's, let's, let's get the substance to it. New sources of dynamics, I think they're enormous. Obviously, the North American energy revolution, as has been mentioned here, particularly in gas. Uh, and I, I think gas it's, uh, has been mentioned. I think the, probably the three of the largest future producers of gas, three of the five or six uh, potential gas producers, are in North America. It, that, that changes the landscape completely. It's me Canada, Mexico, and the United States the, among the first six. Uh, obviously, this has enormous po pos possibilities for for grids, pipelines, there's a Canadian company that already has five projects, pipelines, uh, two, more than 2,000 kilometers, it's there. Uh, cheaper energy, as mentioned, renewable green energy. Uh, I would take a bit of, a, I would be more optimistic than, than the very interesting comments that Professor Plourd made. Uh, it, it is, I would say with all confidence, uh, it is not like, like a, you know, a step in the right direction. I would go more more than that. It's not a step in the right direction. It's a major revolution in the history of Mexico. I think after 1938, that went one way. What, what happened in 1913, it's a major revolution. It's done, okay? You have this, the major obstacle was to, was to have a two-thirds majority. It's done. Now, obviously, you have to make the, the laws. Uh, but uh, to, to come to the constitutional agreement, in the sidelines or not in the sidelines, I think the, the PAN together with the PRI had to look at the more difficult issues which are in the transition articles. And there we changed what was a great limitation. We changed the fact that it was not a good idea to have, it made no sense to have profit sharing. That was, that was like, like, the share, like, the, like the shared contract, that made no sense. We moved to production sharing. And I think uh, the, our, our friends from Norway, very intelligently said, you know, you're debating about concessions. Concession is a bad word in Mexico, but that's an obsolete word. Invite, invent a new word, licenses and permits. And now we'll be working at licenses and permits. Uh, I think that, that, will, that, that will really create enormous revolution uh, in Mexico, in cheaper energy, renewable energy. Pemex has said, we're not interested in shale gas. Huh? That, uh, the Americans have 90,000 wells. Huh? Families will not be doing 90,000 wells. Who can do 90,000 wells? Mexican private sector, uh, Texan tech. Well, some Mexican companies are, 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 are drilling in, in Texas, Visa. Uh, so, you, uh, and certainly, I, I would say, you know, the antennas of the, of the Alberta firms, I think, it should be put because I think that offers, I think, uh, great possibilities in, in shale gas. Second, revolution in infrastructure. I was, uh, somebody was saying yesterday, uh, well, a few, a few weeks, a few, base, a few phase before, the expansion of the port of Veracruz is the greatest since the, perf the Porfiriato times, a doubling or tripling of the capacity of Veracruz. That's a great change. I think the railroad projects are almost as large as the Porfiriato. Now you're having a transpeninsular uh, railroad, a uh, road from Mexico to uh, Querétaro, to Leon, and then to Jalisco. Uh, the, there's a, you know, a, a possibility for the facto dry channel in the, in the isthmus of the Guantepec. It's really a, a, an infrastructure revolution. We have to work at ports, uh, modern, efficient borders, not physical or bureaucratic walls within our two friends. Uh, the drive towards reindustrialization of the region with at $4, uh, $4 the price of gas 
the possibilities for industrialization in the region are absolutely immense. Um, there are many tasks, I think it's mentioned here. Canadian tourism in Mexico, the Canadian tourist to Mexico has to move from sun and beaches to culture, to the Baroque, to, to the Colombian, to pre-Colombian art. Uh, we have to move from Canadian investment into Mexico to Mexican investment towards Canada. We have now a major project that we think will go ahead, uh, and that's the Bimbo. Uh, Bimbo, the Bimbo acquisition will become the largest bread producer in the world. It is already the largest in the United States. It will become the largest one in Canada. And now the worry is that I'll say, well, let's, let's hope that the, the equivalent to our old uh, Canadian Foreign Investment Commission does not put hurdles in the way, okay? As it has happened sometimes. Oh, that's that's, that's you know, the, the, the things have changed uh, upside down. Um, uh, I think, well, Mexicans, uh, as the figures that were mentioned by the Secretary, Mexican students coming to Canada uh, are very large. You open the program, it's flooded uh, by Mexicans, but you open a, a, pro, a reciprocal program to, to Mexico and you know, 400 students. Why? We have to work at Spanish, at the teaching of Spanish. Innovation, I'm sure that in this great project, I think it really uh, uh, pushed forward by Under Secretary Alcocer. I think there are many ideas, I think Fobesi. But it's a pity that Fobesi, I was in a meeting last week with the Americans, they were enthusiastic about Fobesi. Everybody from the uh, US uh, academic community were there, uh, the State Department people, were, they were very enthusiastic about Fobesi. No Canadian participation, uh, that's, that's really, it's really a pity. So I think we can identify some obstacles. Uh, some obstacles, uh, misperceptions and problems. Uh, uh, I think some of the problems that we found to enlist Canada to a meaningful trilateral relationship in 1994 are still there. In some quarters of government, business, or public opinion, I would say, uh, to borrow a t recent title, there is also a nostalgic view uh, that goes back 20 years. A nostalgic view that, is, that still looks in Anglo terms, either to the British Empire, to Britain, or to the special relationship with the US. In this nostalgic view, Mexico is non-existent and is not part, as was said by Professor Duncan, part of North America. This nostalgic view, I think, loses sight of the transformation that have occurred in 20 years. I think it was mentioned here, in a decade or two, Mexico will become the seventh largest economy. We're six or seven hours away from Canadian or US uh, ports. Huge location advantage. We're not 30 years, 30 months, or several weeks. Um, I think uh, the middle class, well, it's not a dream. We have 50 million middle class. That 50 million middle class has the wealth of the Canadians, but we're 50 million, not 30 million. I think that's, uh, that, that's important. I think another change, the, the US will no longer be dependent on Canadian energy. So that part of the special relationship, it will be gone in a few years. So that, that Canadian energy is, is broken. Um, and I think politically, well, the weight, I, it's, it's fair to say the weight of 20 to 30 million Mexicans in the United States, I think gives us a significant political clout. So I think, you know, we should not compete in establishing special relationships. I think uh, we're, uh, that, that not, we should not play there. Our other obstacle is not nostalgia, but economic fashions. The trade agreement with Europe is a great success. We really congratulate the, author the Canadian authorities for it. TPP is very promising. Mexico is also looking both towards the Atlantic to, re, to re, re, reinvigorate our existing trade relation with trade agreement with the Cure. And we're also looking to the Pacific, and I would highlight the Pacific Alliance. I think that really holds great promise. We hope that sometime Canada will join. Uh, the North American uh, countries, countries together can really strengthen our, our negotiations. And some uh, very good writers, friends of ours, have said the European agreement is good, but do not forget NAFTA and your existing friends. Uh, it was hinted here, trade within North America now is twice the trade of North America with all of Asia. And, and trade with Europe, a trade within North America is three times that of North America with the whole of Europe. Uh, Mexico is a young population. Tr I was underlined trained in Western values uh, and culture. Uh, the academic community always brings the knowledge uh, of objective history constructive criticism, criticism and, and, uh, and the analysis of the present, as I was seeing today, very fresh ideas for the future. I think you can contribute usefully, and I'm sure here our colleagues in the embassy, certainly the, in Mexico, I think it's been done by, very efficiently by your undersecretary. Uh, and I would lastly say, because it, the topic came here, I think to put in a sense, you know, concrete actions, uh, I would very much think of the possibility 
that for the forthcoming meeting of President Peña and, uh, and uh, Prime Minister Harper, uh, it will be possible to set up the model of a Mexican chair in, in Canadian universities, the Mexican chair, there are some, and this Mexican chair can, I think the advantage is very cost effective. Initially, a Mexican chair, all that it requires is a good technical committee that, you know, get together, people that, you know, in themselves will be networking. You set up a Canadian chair, you pay a, a plane ticket for the Canadian chair yeah, to, the, to the presentation. You come here and you go back, you pay hotels, that costs nothing in terms of the, of, the, of the value. The Mexican chair can become a Mexican seminar of a week. And the Mexican seminar of a week can become a center for Mexican studies. We have to get the uh, private sector involved. I think all, all our governments are very, uh, very uh, uh, reduced in money. Uh, and I think this can be, uh, I think we would love if Carlton could be one example of this. A, a Mexican chair in Carlton obviously had to be mirror uh, Mexican chairs in, 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 in so Canadian chairs in, in Mexico has already to some extent exist. And I think it would be a great step forward in this soft power that's very interesting. Thank you very much for your, for your, for your. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Suarez, um, and thank you, um, Under Secretary, for participating in this event. And um, uh, this closes our session. But I would say, um, feel at home. Come back to Carlton. We're open to take this dialogue further, as you saw this morning. It was a very enriching discussion, and um, lots of issues to think about. And um, let's let's move forward. Um, and we're happy to be involved with you in, in taking this forward to the next step. So thank you, everyone, for participating this morning. Thank you.